everybody new visitors or repeated visitors here? New? Okay. Uh, if we have to you evacuate the building, the nearest exit is going to be on that door right there. Just remember, as we head out, our evacuation site is going to be in this parking lot. We'll take roll, and that's where we're going to hang out until we get further instructions. Uh, for those of you that are unaware of what we offer here at the Energy Center, I just want to mention, uh, during your break time, if you have, if you are interested in looking into some of our other offerings, uh, we have our workshop calendars. Take a look around and uh, look at the different exhibits that we have throughout the centers. Uh, we have a smart home exhibit. We have an industrial center in the back, so feel free to wander and take a, take, take a tour, a self-guided tour, and look at our offerings as well as our tool lending library. Okay. Uh, next, I would like to introduce David Zabrowski with Food Service Technology Center. Thank you. Uh, all right, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, good, good. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. This is one of those great events, and I know that we, we wish we could do this every year, but it's, we kind of like to build up a little bit of demand. And one of the things that's so exciting about this year's induction class is that there's just a lot more, a lot more technology that's available that was not even available two years ago. And you're going to be able to see some of it in action after the class. And we've got some great panel of speakers, a lot of good information, and a lot of great show and tell. So you know, bring your curiosity. And you know, definitely feel free to touch things, try things, ask questions, uh, participate and uh, enjoy yourselves today. Uh, we also have, uh, we are broadcasting today, so one thing I will ask everybody is if you do have questions, I think we'll have a mic going around, um, and we'll just make sure that you get the questions on the microphone so that the audience that is toning in can hear the questions as well. So for today, I'm gonna uh, just provide a brief overview of who we are. Um, the, we had, had a name change a couple of years ago, which kind of confused folks a little bit, but Food Service Technology Center, fishnick.com, that's still who we are. We're now uh, called Frontier Energy, but we're still Food Service Technology Center, fishnick.com, and we operate the Food Service Technology Center in partnership with the California Investor-Owned Utilities. So that's uh, basically PG&E, uh, SoCal Gas, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, and also uh, LA Water and Power is a uh, partner in what we're calling California Energy Wise. The, the focus of this statewide program, and this is really, really unique. It's, it's something that just continues to amaze and, and thrill me because when you go to other states, you just don't see this kind of collaboration amongst competing utilities, particularly competing fuel sources. You really see uh, the, the utilities trying to, to leverage for market share, and you just don't see this consistent message from the utilities that are partnering together to provide real honest information to operators so that they can make smart equipment choices, the best choices for their operation. And sometimes there's one fuel or another it may be the best op op option for you. Our big point is we want whatever choice you have, whatever choice you make, to be the right choice for your operation and to use the least amount of energy possible. There's a really good driving force for, for using less energy, and that's one of the things that we're all trying to do. So in partnership with the different utilities, with the different test kitchens, and we're just really thrilled to have that California Energy Wise as the umbrella for all, all the things that we do within this group. And just food, the food service team has just been a great group to work with. For those of you that are interested, I did uh, send our handouts to our IT person and asked to have them posted. And it's fishnick.com handouts, today's date. And uh, you know, if anybody is interested in getting the handouts for this. I, I mentioned that so you don't have to scramble to take notes too much. The, the website uh, address is fairly easy to find. And this allows you to get to the information so you can refer back to it. Everything that I'm presenting today is in the handouts. I didn't reserve any slides for today, so it's all there. Now, the main thing we want to do is really give you an opportunity to dive deeply into the various technologies that are available, the various options that are available for this type of equipment, to learn what induction can do and some of the benefits of induction, and to learn some of the practical things you need to know about induction. There's some really important things. It's a new technology, and with all, ne with all new and emerging technologies, there are things that are different about that than other standard technologies. And it's important for us to be aware of these things as we start looking at 
how we want to use it, what we want to do with it, and start understanding the way it can work within our operation. And I think that's why having all of our experts that we have today are very, very exciting. And we'll have uh, presentations following mine. We'll have presentations from Volrath, from Cook Tech in the back, and from Garland, and then followed by some live cooking. And uh, Volrath actually brought their truck getting ahead of myself, but Volroth brought their truck and you can walk through their truck and see a lot of the different equipment that they have as well um, as what they have in the room today. And the, the other thing is we want to build up some awareness of how much energy costs for your operation. Because one of the one of the challenges with food service operations is that we're all dealing with, well actually food service, any business today. Honestly, any business today, we've got rising commodity costs, rising labor costs, rising insurance costs, um, rising utility costs. And utility costs are really, really becoming a, a much bigger portion of, of our overall operating costs than they ever used to be. And that's just due to the fact that there's a lot of money that has to go into the infrastructure. You know, a lot of the utility infrastructures are 100 years old. There's a lot of investment. And that's not just in California. That's across the country. Uh, we're really seeing rising costs in terms of maintaining that infrastructure. And so using the utilities as wisely as possible is really, really critical. And becoming aware of how much energy our, our utilities are using is really, really helpful in terms of making smart choices so that we can weigh overall costs. Because one of the challenges with buying food source equipment is that we're often thinking about what does that piece cost? And looking at two pieces, and food service equipment's beautiful. They're, they're stainless steel boxes. It's very sexy. But they, you know, when, you sign up, when you line up one next to the other, they often look kind of the same. And that difference in price starts to look like it's a bigger portion of the difference between the equipment. And what we want to show you is that there's more to think about than just the first cost of equipment. And then provide you with some tools to be able to do that. So first, I do want to say thank you to the sponsors that are that are supporting this event here at Southern California Edison today, Volrath, Cook Tech, and, and Garland. And without the manufacturer sponsorship and participation for these events, we wouldn't be able to have as much knowledge because we really rely on their, their engineering expertise and their ability to provide us training on their equipment so that we can talk intelligently about it and also get the opportunities to, do, to provide some of the demonstrations and case studies that I'm going to show you later today. Uh, to this, I also want to add a special thank you to the California Energy Commission, a portion of the material and case studies I'm going to present today was funded through a grant from the California Energy Commission, uh, their program called EPIC. So when we start looking at uh, designing a kitchen or designing equipment for the kitchen, you know, what are some of the really, really important aspects of what we're looking for when we're thinking about it? What's, what's the number one thing that comes to mind? Um, okay, so from Catherine, X design, so, so flow, flow is important, and actually really, really important. Sometimes we're dealing with uh, complicated spaces with lots of crossover of workers, it becomes a problem, and so thinking about that flow is important. Um, so space um, is a major part of that aspect, flexibility. Um, are we designing for a menu, and when's, when are we going to change the menu? It used to be you designed for a menu, and you knew that it was going to be good for five years, ten years, and now we're seeing that... Uh, a lot of restaurants are starting to have to freshen their look and freshen their offerings every you know, two to three years, and uh, and so just to keep just to keep the clientele, you know, the clientele is much more demanding. And what we all want, what everybody going out to eat wants, is they want a new experience. And it's not lo it's no longer the I want to go here because they make my favorite thing the way I like it made, and I'm going to have it that way all of my life, I'm still a bit like that, but, uh, but really a lot of the more discerning diners are wanting something new, something different, something fresh. And so the question is, how much does the equipment that we put into our kitchens offer that flexibility to do new and different and fresh without having to change things up? So Catherine's comment about flow becomes very, very important because if you start changing the menu up, how much does that do that? One of the things that's great about what we're talking about today and the equipment we're talking about today is it has a great deal of flexibility. And the other thing that I really, really like about it is it puts the energy where you need it, into the cooking utensil or into the food. And that's one of the things that we lost. I was talking with, uh, oh, we were talking this morning about the way kitchens used to be and how it was not uncommon for kitchens to be 95, 100, 110. ASHRAE, actually, the American Society for heating, refrigerating, and air conditioning engineers did a study about three years ago where they actually hired a university to go around to over 100 kitchens all around the country and measure kitchen temperatures. And they actually found that the temperatures on the kitchen cook line could get as high as 110 degrees. 
And they're now they're not starting a study to look at dish rooms. We're not talking about dish rooms today, but just know that dish rooms, if kitchens are hot, dish rooms are hotter um, because you have all the humidity from the steam. So that's changing because nobody really, really wants to work in those horrible environments anymore. We're kind of, there's a lot of workers, there's a worker shortage and there's this problem of saying, hey, I don't want to work in an environment where it's a sweatshop. And in a lot of industries, they actually have conditioned spaces. Kitchens are kind of the last, last holdout of not really having fully conditioned spaces. One of the ways, one of the challenges, that's going to really increase costs in terms of now you're conditioning a space where you're taking all the air and moving it through the space constantly and taking it out. How do we deal with that? Well, one of the ways we can deal with that is have less heat from the equipment. And that's one thing that induction provides. I think one of the aspects that was missing from that list, though, is performance. Performance is extremely important for any kitchen because if it doesn't perform, if you can't get the food out, you can't get the food out consistently, then everything else just kind of falls away. Uh, your, your, your diners just aren't going to wait. Nobody's got, a, nobody's got the, the attention span to wait for things anymore. So we really need that quick turnover. We need to make sure that that equipment performs and does produce the food that it's supposed to produce. So one of the challenges that we've always had with the industry is there just wasn't that, that open data. And where do you go for that information? And that, again, goes back to the California Energy Wise and the California Utilities partnering to provide this information from a third party and unbiased source. And the beginnings of that data is really starting with a standard protocol, a road test, your, your miles per gallon, your EPA figure for your cars. Um, you know that you're not going to drive your car the way the EPA tests your car, but at least it gives you a comparative tool between the different pieces of equipment. And one of the things that's unique about these, a these ASTM, American Society for Testing Material Standards, is that they use real food product. They're, they're not just using some kind of inert mass, you know, a block of metal to represent food. They're actually using real food to represent real food. And that's something that provides, that means that when we give a, a, a result from testing and we say that this piece of equipment has a certain cooking capacity, we know that, it, that it's real because we measured it with real food. And so you can trust in those numbers to match what you're going to need for your operation and to size it correctly. So one of the things that comes out of that metric, of, out of that testing with real food, is a measure of efficiency. And when we're, we're talking about energy efficiency, there's a lot of measures, a lot of ways to define efficiency. But for the purposes of these ASTM standards and for the purposes of my discussion today, when I talk about energy efficiency, I'm really talking about how much energy that the appliance consumed that you bought at the meter, that you paid Edison for at the meter on electric, or you paid the gas company uh, for gas equipment at the meter, how much of that energy actually made it into doing useful work, which is cooking the food? In this example, um, how much of the energy consumed by the espresso machine got into my cappuccino? And the answer, uh, actually, in a lot of cases, is that there's a lot less of that energy is getting into the food than we might think. Uh, we're, we like hearing numbers, efficiency numbers that are really high in the 80s, 90s percent. And a lot of cooking equipment, the majority of it, the energy efficiency is in the 30 percent, 20 percent. Walks, 10 percent. Um, so it really, really matters. And it does make a big difference. What that means is, where's all that energy going? So you've got to ask yourself, well, if the energy is not going into the food, where is it going? Well, it's going into the space. That's why kitchens are so hot. The reason why kitchens are hot is because most of the energy is going in there creating heat, and the heat's not going where you need it. And so we have to have all this ventilation, so we try to get as much of it out of the space as possible. The same test that gives us energy efficiency gives us uh, the, the cooking energy rates. These become important numbers on electric equipment because that's how much you know, a lot of times when you look at your energy bill, there's the uh, total amount of energy you're using, but there's also the instantaneous amount of energy you're using called your peak demand. And that's that sustained amount over a 15 minute, per 15 minute window. And that peak period will, depending on when you use it, what time of day you're using it can affect your operation. And time of use uh, is coming. And it's, and it's shifting for California. The time of use used to be noon to six, and now it's four to nine. Thanks, Young. Four to nine. And that's going to change the way we think about our equipment. And so knowing when we need to use the energy and trying to figure out ways to not use energy when we don't need it is important. So start thinking about smart controls and start thinking about intelligent equipment. You know, we all use an uh, intelligent device. I think every day all of us have a cell phone, right? And it's, I think there's more computing power in this than uh, was used to put people on the moon in 1969. So uh, we're not afraid of technology. We're not afraid of information technology. Let's start using it where we can use it the most in the equipment. And a lot of the equipment you'll see today has some of that capability.
Production capacity comes out of that same cooking test that gives us our efficiency number, and that tells us how many pounds of food we can cook based on not only how long does it take to cook the food, but how long does it take for the appliance to recover back up to a ready-to-cook condition after we cook that food. And that's an important aspect because you've got all this stored energy. You've got, you're working with a, hot, a heated surface or a heated, uh, heated chamber, and when you put cold food in there, that takes some of that heat out. You need to replenish that heat so it's ready for the next load. And that's one of the things that really is a driving uh, difference between a lot of equipment that we see is how quickly can you get that heat into the box to recover for the next uh, piece of equipment, for the next load. On that espresso machine example that I've been showing, it's like how good is the recovery for the boiler? If we pull a bunch of shots, when that line's out the door, um, how quickly does it recover so we can pull the next set of shots and steam the next set of milk for the next cappuccino? And we'll see some of that in, in today's discussion. We're not talking cappuccinos today, but uh, it's only time. It's only a matter of time. There'll be induction in espresso machines. So the point is that all, all equipment is not created equal. When we start looking at the various performance aspects of it, there is a big difference. So now let's get into some of the, some of the specific differences we're talking about with induction. Uh, the, the, the primary ind ap as, uh, application for induction has really been the cooktop. And the reason why we're using the cooktop is because it, it makes a lot of sense. Basically, for, for cooking on a range or cooking on a stove, we're, we're cooking indirectly. We've got a utensil, we've got a pan, we're putting the energy into the pan, and that's where our food product is. Now, the question is, how, how effectively do we get that energy to a pan? If we're looking at a gas range, we're burning a flame underneath the pan, that flame's rumping around the pan, the energy is going very, very quickly past the pan, very little of that energy actually gets into the pan. If we're talking about your old, old electric range that we all grew up with and decided that we never were gonna cook with electric again for the rest of our lives um, you know, with, with, the, with the speed coil, where you have this element that's in contact with the pan and you wait for the element to heat up and then the pan heats up and then, oh wait a minute, it's too hot. Now you try to cool it down, but it doesn't cool down. And so how many omelets have we burned with an electric stove until we figured out exactly how to cook with it? Induction really changes that paradigm, and we'll get into that in a minute. Even within that standard set of gas versus electric, there's a wide difference in energy efficiency and how much energy gets into that pot to cook that product. And for your, uh, for your average open burner range, you know, 35 is a pretty good efficiency, even though the industry standard is supposed to be 40 and better. Um, it's, there's ways to kind of pretend that you get to 40 and better, but really it's, that's what we're seeing as an average. Uh, on a hot top where you're basically, instead of going a discrete element, instead, and we've got a, basically a heated iron top, and we're keeping that entire top hot, well, think about that. We've got our pan occupying a little bit of that space, and then how all the rest of the space is just radiating heat out to the kitchen. And in fact, those, those tops can be 500, 600, 700 degrees, depending on the top. And that's not doing useful work. That's just, that's just a radiator for the kitchen space. It'd be great if we were in Alaska in the wintertime. That might, we might like it, but a lot of times we're not. So um, it's not so good. And then there was a new advanced technology burner, a prototype powered burner technology that was able to get the efficiencies up you know, closer, to, closer to 50%. Now we switch to electric and we're looking at energy at the meter that goes into the pot. Your, your electric hot top, again, is not as efficient as your, open, or your standard element. But when we go to induction, what's happening? What's happening is the induction the magnetic field is heating the pot. The pot's getting hot. There's no waste heat. You don't have that waste radiant heat, that waste conductive heat on, the, on getting the surface of the top of the range hot. All the heat's going where it needs to go. And this is an average efficiency. We're actually starting to see some even improved efficiencies from induction. What does that mean? That means there's less waste heat going where you don't need it. That means there's cooler work surfaces, cooler kitchen, cooler operating conditions. And I've got, and one of the things that came out of that is we did, did a study looking at it. So I'm gonna flash past this because I know that uh, Volrath, uh, Cooktech, and, and, and Garland are gonna talk a little bit more details about how induction works and specifically how they're applying it. But basically you're creating a magnetic field, it's getting the molecules in the pan hot, and then the pan, those, those molecules, they get excited, they vibrate, they create energy, and then the pan becomes that energy source. So we don't have an energy source beneath the pan. We actually, the, inner, the pan becomes the energy source. The downside of it is you have to use special cookware, which was a barrier until cookware became fairly inexpensive, and induction-ready pans are fairly ubiquitous now. So that's no longer the, the barrier that it was when the technology first was introduced. I like to show this, and I think you'll see this, probably a picture very much like this later on, but this was taken with a, a infrared camera, I think one of those ones you just attach to your iPhone, and uh, 
really see where the heat is. And what you're seeing is that the surface of the pan is very, very hot, but the surfaces around the pan are not. And that's really, that, all that is, is is graphically explaining what we already sh what I showed you in the previous slide, the efficiency. Where's the heat going? The heat's going where you need it. It's not, where it's not going is where you don't need it. What if we compared um, a back of the house range, um, and we did this, we did a study with a manufacturer where we looked at a, a six burner range um, versus a six burner induction, and we came up with a model, we did a bunch of different types of cooking, we did simmer, we did uh, heat up, we did saute, and we came up with a model to compare these, and we found that you know, using on a standard range with you know, not super high input burners, 25,000 V2 burners, so fairly standard burners, uh, that range, based on a model using different types of cooking operations, fairly heavy volume, would cost about a, a 1,100 bucks a year to operate. That same induction range, even though there's a wide disparity, particularly in California, between gas and electric utility costs, that induction range was essentially the same cost. So what we're saying is normally one of the challenges with electric, particularly in California where electricity is a lot more expensive than gas per unit, is it can be a bit of a challenge uh, economically unless you, can use, unless you can take advantage of those energy efficiencies and get more out of the fuel that you're using. One of the things I like about this is that that induction range, you're not taking a hit in cost. You're really getting some, you're getting the same, but you're getting a benefit in performance. You're getting higher productivity. You're getting lower space temperatures. Let's take this one step further and look at its impact on ventilation. Because ventilation, based on a lot of studies that have been done over the years, ventilation cost for restaurants is about a third of the total energy use associated with the operating a restaurant. It's pretty, pretty significant. And if you can do anything to reduce the amount of air you have to remove from the space, that reduces the amount of heating and cooling you have to do during those design degree hot days when it's 110 degrees outside and you really need to cool the air a little bit or, you're gonna, or your workers walk out on you. Or if you're you know, in, a, in a cold area in the wintertime, you don't really want to be bringing in you know, 40, 40 degree air or, or colder air into the kitchen. So you end up having to heat that air only to then turn around and just throw it back outside again because you have to remove the air that's capturing all that effluent. If you can reduce that, it makes a big difference. So we did a comparison. Um, that goes back to the comparison I just showed, but we did a comparison. We had a controlled environmental chamber that we used to test the amount of heat load on the space and what the exact ventilation rate is associated with those operations. And we came up with some interesting comparisons. I apologize for the tininess of the uh, slide here. Uh, I don't think my laser pointer worked. But I apologize for the tiniest of the slide. But the bottom line is, what I want to do is compare the peak ventilation rates uh, for the gas range top, and that was at 1,000 CFM for just a gas range top, versus, uh, versus the induction range top, which was down around 700 CFM on average. And that's because there's a lot less heat plume coming off that surface. And you can feel it if you stand in front of a gas range versus when it's on, or an electric hot top when it's on, versus induction, you don't see as much going on there. The bottom line is that there's, and, and this is why I posted the handout so that you could see this in a little more detail and you can dig at it. Um, and we can also provide the report to anybody who's interested. Uh, the bottom line is that there's a dramatic reduction in ventilation rates. When we add up what the cost is to move the air through the space, or the difference in heating and cooling costs for the average city in California, we come up with a dramatic difference. And we have a calculator that was uh, developed, again, through a grant from the Energy Commission that calculates heating and cooling loads based on the amount of airflow you have. And your heating and cooling load for the gas range was you know, $600 a year and fairly temperate com climate uh, versus you know, around $400 a year for the induction. So we're also saving energy there. So when we look at the energy associated with induction versus other type of fuel sources, we have to, we, we, we can actually look at the interactive impact on the ventilation rate for the space. And if you're doing it from a basic design, that gives us an opportunity to design lower airflow into the kitchen from the get-go. In your existing kitchen, it allows you to turn down that airflow somewhat if you replace your equipment with more efficient equipment. We've also done comparative testing between different types of induction cooktops. And again, just like with uh, any other appliance that I would show, 
they're not all created equal, and there are some differences. I kind of hid the names on these, but one of the things I wanted to point out is one was 80% efficient, one was 83% efficient. So there are some differences, and ask the folks when you look at these units about those, uh, or ask, ask the vendors when you're talking around after the class, ask them what the efficiency is of their equipment. They'll have, they should have that data because it's a fairly easy test to run. So we, what, one of the benefits we get, and you're gonna hear this over and over today, is that induction is, is fast. It puts the heat where you need it. One of the things I didn't even talk about, and I'll probably talk about a little bit later, is that they're easy to clean because you have that solid top surface, which is just fantastic. And that's a labor savings device as well. Uh, is you, it's, and it's and labor savings, not in terms of getting rid of labor, but in terms of using your labor more effectively. Um, instead of having somebody really taking an hour after closing to break down the range and clean it, uh, or not, and then having a mechanical failure later on, and having a service call in about you know six months, um, you really can just have a quick wipe down and you're done. It's also much more controllable, and you're going to hear a lot of discussion about that in terms of how precise the control is with induction, which is much more precise than you have with other other technologies. The thing that makes today very very exciting, of course, is all the options. There's just so many different types of applications of induction that are available from your, not just your cooktops anymore, but you've, you've got induction woks, you've got induction warmers, you've got induction soup wells, you've got induction uh, steam tables, you've got uh, induction griddles, induction um, braising pans. You're gonna be able to see all of these things today and many of them in action. And so it's very, very exciting to see what's going on. In this um, California Energy Commission study that I mentioned at the very start of my talk, uh, the focus of the study is quantifying the energy consumption of what they're calling plug load, which is basically anything electric that plugs in, but really focusing in on cooking and warming equipment that's on the countertop, the little stuff, the stuff that we kind of ignore and just say, you know, we're not really paying attention to it. But what we realize as we start looking at it is these little loads add up to be quite a lot. And when we start looking at how many different pieces of plug load equipment, there was a survey that was done as part of the study, how many different pieces are just running all the time? Uh, you know, the conveyor toaster that's running in the middle of the morning when nobody's going to toast a bagel for an hour, but you can't shut it off because it takes too long to eat back up again. That's what this, pro this uh, program's focusing in on, and it's really showing a lot of uh, savings opportunities. I want to just highlight a couple of case studies that are come out of this that focus in on the induction, the, the class uh, topic for today and really show you what some of the benefits are. So the first one is the soup warmer. And we have the standard soup warmer where you have the, uh, the water, you have the electric element underneath the pan, you fill it with water, you put the pan insert in there, steam drops around the thing and it provides that nice heat transfer, keeps the soup hot, and uh, steam leaks out a little bit, but you know, it's, it's not too bad, right? We've got an average energy holding rate of 330 watts versus induction to do the same thing and no water for only 100 watts. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but now let's start adding up how many of these soup wells we might have. And oh, and by the way, that steam that's leaking out around the pan, that's going into the space, it's making your space more humid. It's not just evaporating and disappearing, it's actually still there. And so there's a big potential for savings. I seem to have a moving cursor, yeah. Um, in a number of different sites, we were compared standard soup well technology to induction well technology, we had a very consistent and dramatic saving, energy savings across the board. We did uh, have an opportunity working with a, an operator that was designing a new restaurant concept, and this was a sort of a fusion flavor concept, and one of the things he was gonna have is he had planned to have an entire serving line with steam tables, and it was, he was going for a sort of fast, casual, slightly upscale lunch technology, and he was doing a sort of an Indian-Mexican uh, wrap sort of fusion with different flavors, very, very interesting, um, sort of mishmash of, of flavors. But he was gonna have different kinds of curries and, and hot products, and then he was gonna have a grill to, to, to heat the wraps and then wrap up the order. And he had, induct he had basically planned those soup wells. So after he saw this induction technology, he put it into his restaurant and outfitted the entire thing with these induction wells. And we calculated that the estimated savings just with these 12 wells was 800 bucks a year, but also his space is a lot cooler. The serving line stays cool. He doesn't have steam. One of the things he commented on is that he doesn't have steam fogging up the sneeze guard and causing problems where people can't see the food behind it. The other thing that he's saying is his hold time is longer. 
because, I don't know if we all want to hear whole times longer, but, but basically he was having less food waste because the food wasn't caramelizing around the edges of the, of the pan insert. He was actually retaining better food quality, which meant that he had happier customers that were more willing to come back, and he had to replenish the pans less frequently during service because he was able to get the full quantity of food that he's prepared out of those pans. So that, these are things to talk about and look at when you're looking around at the equipment afterwards. A similar study, this is one that uh, Southern California Edison completed recently for uh, a large restaurant chain, looked at comparing standard steam wells to uh, dry um, uh, induction holding wells. And then one of the other things that was noted is that when you take the pans out, the induction wells aren't using any energy, which is just a fantastic idea. And so we're getting the same, and they have the same things that our independent restaurant, oper uh, restaurant operator experience in terms of better production, better holding, and less steam in the space, much more comfortable and much more effective work environment. The savings for this, it was uh, 5,400 kilowatt hours a year. So pretty substantial in terms of that. And this report is available on the Emerging Technologies Coordinating Council website. You can get there, uh, etcc-ca.com. We'll get you the website where you can download this report. So a couple of different types of examples where we looked at something very simple that we never paid any attention to before, which is induction holding, and found some great gains, and great, great savings, but not just great savings, great non-energy benefits associated with this, with this technology that were a big benefit to the operation and made the operations much more successful. So, so there's a number of things you want to think about. Um, and a number of benefits from the energy side, from the non-energy side, from the performance side, that you can start to think about relative to this equipment. And ask those questions, but also ask the hard questions. Ask about installation, because installation is really a tricky thing. And make sure that you understand all the specifics about installation that you might need to know for, say, a drop-in type of configuration, which may be a little bit different than other types of equi uh, equipment. And take advantage of the fact that you have experts in the room to talk to today. Um, looking real quickly at induction, another application, this was also part of the California Energy Commission plug load going back to how, where we started, which is the, uh, the burner. This was, or the, uh, the, the, the hot top. This was an example where we worked with a small cafe that had a, uh, a hot top just in the back. They were using an electric hot top, and we replaced that with induction. And they were able to save $600 a year just from that switch. And it was fairly, and it, that was a very easy switch because those little uh, countertop induction units are fairly inexpensive. And it, really the, the biggest challenge is just getting the operation to trust that the new technology is going to work and work consistently. And that's something that we're able to show with this example. I, I like to pull out this quote from, uh, from Cindy Little. Uh, we were talking to him about one of the things in the future. And one of the things that he talks about is flexibility. We started out the, the uh, the session with the talk about flexibility and how that how important that is. And the other thing is he was talking about how induction can be a major aspect of that flexibility and how we can use that. And so some examples of being bringing that cooking out in display, out to the front of the house, is the idea of a ventless mobile cooking station, which you can do with induction because you don't have it. In, in some cases. Now, anytime I say ventless, I have to caveat it that check with your local uh, environmental health authority because every county is different and every inspector is different. And so you need to work with them as you start thinking about ventless for operations. Ask them early. Um, don't spring it on them on, on the inspectors at the end because they, know they don't like that. Um, but they often will work with you. And we've seen many applications where induction, many induction appliances are able to go in with a ventless operation. The certain was a mobile cooking stand, and I believe we have one in the back of the room that uh, you can take a look at. It gives you a lot of flexibility to bring in an event type of application where you're, you're changing the space up, keeping it live, keeping it fresh, keeping it fun. And I think that that is a lot of what's one of the major trends we're seeing in the industry today. So with all these opportunities and all these different types of equipment, you know, where do you go? I'm gonna come back to the California Utilities, is that they're a resource. Please come, talk to them. The people at, at, at Southern California Gas, Senate, Southern California Gas, PG&E, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, they love this stuff. Uh, we live and breathe it, we, we love the equipment, we love to help you out, and we love to be able to provide this information for you. So please come to us. And the, the other thing to be aware of is that there are incentives that are available for purchasing energy efficient equipment. And there is a standard catalog of, 
equipment that's covered under the existing incentive program. And I'm going to apologize as I'm promoting the incentive program and say, well, induction's not in there yet. But there have been situations where with a custom design or a custom process change out, there is a possibility of being able to get incentives for that custom project. But you have to involve the utility early, and you want to contact your uh, local, if you're talking about an induction process or an induction design in your kitchen, there's a program called Savings by Design that is part of that and looks at everything around the the new build, the new build from the lighting to the HVAC to the process loads, and so you can start to look at that and use that as an opportunity. And talk to your local Edison um, representative, and they can help you out with that. And you know, visit the California Energy Wise table at the back of the booth. Uh, gather some information on there and learn about the rebates. If you are uh, looking at equipment, also talk to your local dealer and ask them if they're participating in a. Uh, program that we call a uh, point of sale where the utilities are offering the incentive through the dealer and the dealer is able to provide that cut that incentive directly to the customer for qualifying pieces of equipment uh, for qualifying customers so definitely ask about that because that is that makes it easy nobody has to fill out or well the dealer fills out the form but nobody else has to fill out a form so you get a lot of opportunities to be able to do this um, and then I actually have the old solutions directory. There's a new solutions directory available from uh, Southern California Edison that has a variety of different pieces of equipment. So look at anything, but basically go to your Edison representative and ask them about all the different things you can have from food service to lighting upgrades to ventilation upgrades to refrigeration upgrades. Anything you're doing within your business, there's a number of different solutions that are available for you. And, uh, or you can just grab Young here in the back and uh, tell him that you, you're interested in rebates for your business and he'll help you out. So. All right, um, and then we do have a list of qualifying products, so if you are interested in the rebates through the California Energy Wise program and you wanna know where that is, there is a website called caenergywise.com. Uh, easy enough to remember, there's also some, some materials in the back, and that has the complete list for each utility of what equipment already qualifies for the rebate, what the model is, what the performance information is, as I'm showing here in the chart, and what the rebate amount is. And so you can figure out exactly what's covered under the, under the scope of the program. So some, just real quickly, um, summing up and some, some key takeaways is the specs matter. Efficiency is really, really important. You're gonna have this equipment for a long time. You're gonna be using it for a long time. You wanna make sure that you make the right choice up front. And that's one of the reasons why we have incentives is to help you make that right choice. Uh, that's why the utilities are trying to encourage that operation because utilities want customers to stay in business. It's much better to have a customer that stays in business than to have a bunch of customers that keep going out of business. So that's the last thing we want. So we really want to help you be successful. And that's why we want you to be energy efficient. And the other thing that's important is to think about how the equipment is installed and commissioned and started up. And that's important that it's done correctly. Many warranty claims come from equipment not either, either not being installed correctly um, or not being commissioned correctly. So it's important to have that done and make sure that that's done correctly. And also make sure that your staff is trained on the equipment so they know how to operate it and utilize the, the, the support from the local manufacturer's representatives to make sure you get your training and have your questions answered. You can also come and get some support training from the, from the utility food service equipment centers. And that's how, that, you know, having all that really helps you maximize that benefit of the equipment. So from that, I'll say thank you. Catherine's been in the food service industry. She's actually a, a lifelong food service. Uh, she's been working for over 35 years. She trained at Cornell. Um, she's worked for hotel chains, uh, managed various restaurants, did food service design, uh, did some uh, software creation. Um, she's an active member of the uh, Construction Speci Specifications Institute, CSI, and Food Service Consultant Society International, FCSI, and is just a great champion for induction. Um, so let's welcome Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm probably a little bit shorter, too. So I, I actually think of myself more as an induction evangelist. I was classically trained, and I do believe induction is the future. So first, I do want to thank the Food Service Technology Center for inviting us. I think this is a great thing that they're doing. I think it's, it's awesome to educate especially operators, people who don't always have a chance to get out and see what's new, to see what is new and that this is actually real. Uh, Valrath, we also have with us Ray Poche. He is our regional manager for the western part of our country. And Bonnie Levin, she is the district manager for Southern California. So you have two local people here in addition to myself. And I am actually from Wisconsin because that's where Valrath is located in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. 
So let me see if I can manage the technology here to keep us moving. So first, does everybody understand induction and the technology? Does anybody, has anybody, how many people have even heard of induction and know where we're at with induction? Well, I know you do, and you guys, yeah. Okay, so what, what is really unique about induction, and I'm gonna try to explain this, is that induction, when you turn it on, all it really does when you turn it on is it creates an alternating magnetic field. It doesn't create heat. It creates an alternating magnetic field. The heat is generated when you actually place a magnetic pan on top. So if we go to this next slide, on the right is a gas range, and you see how the heat kind of comes up around the pan. That's one of the inefficiencies of gas, is it doesn't go all up in the pan, it comes up around the pan. But the one on the left is induction, and if you understand the thermographics, that white line, that's where the most heat is. And that just shows you that all the heat is coming off the burner and going directly into the pan. So when we talk about it being safe and when we talk about it being energy efficient, that's what we're talking about. If I turned on, well, some of us, we have turned on all these induction units and we didn't put any pans in there, does every, can anybody guess what happens? Nothing. Because there's no pan. You have to have a pan. So that's kind of what's neat about induction. Nothing would happen. In fact, most of these units are set, if nothing happens, to turn themselves off after a while so that they don't just sit there. Okay? All right, so that's good. So I... I think it's important when you start learning about induction and thinking about induction to choose the correct unit. Um, I see, I go visit a lot of sites. You know, I'm the design solutions manager. I work with designers. I go into sites sometimes when they're having problems. And one of the biggest mistakes I see made is picking the wrong piece of induction for your application. So you really need to understand how you want to use the induction. Because I can tell you on our table right there, we have anywhere from 300 watts up to 1,800 watts. And if you look at some of these other manufacturers that are here, they're going to go all the way up to 5,000 watts. That is a lot of power when you start talking about induction. So um, you really need to be realistic in how many watts do you need. We've created a warmer for holding food that works on 300 watts. Do you know what the power draw on 300 watts is? It's like one amp. And that's at full heat. After a while, it's down to less than an amp. It's, it's really low, but it holds food. Or if you want to cook on a stock pot, well, then you start looking at that, those higher wattage, the 3,500 and the 5,000 watt units. Um, the efficiency is really important too. And I'm going to do a little case study here in a minute with two of our units to just talk to you a little bit about efficiency and cost. You are going to find units out there that are going to be sold as commercial for $100. Beware, caveat, beware. Make sure you understand. There's, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things to look for when you're looking at a unit. Make sure you understand what you're purchasing. And make sure the units are rated. In this country, <laughs> all these units should be UL, NSF, and FCC. And a lot of these commercial units are not FCC. And I don't know how many of you are deeply. I don't want to get too nerdy on you because I'm really good at doing that. But what the FCC rating does, does anybody understand noise when we're talking about electricity? Noise is kind of what burns up your motors and kills things. What the FCC does is it guarantees that any noise coming from the wall will not destroy your unit. And it also means that any noise your unit creates does not go back into the wall. So that FCC rating is important. It means the unit has an EMI board and it makes it much more expensive. So that's important too, to have, make sure it has all three ratings. You will see a lot with just UL and NSF, but that, that FCC rating is important. All right, so let's see where we're at here. Um, I'm not clicking. Shake it. Okay, there it is, okay. So I kind of talked about this already, but there is a unit for every situation. And, and this actually shows, we do have some higher, higher wattage units. We have our induction walk, which is 3000 watts. We also have a back of house unit that is at 3000 watts. So just again, be sure that when you look that you get the unit you need. I can actually tell you, I just recently in Chicago had to go to a site where they had two of our 2.9 kilowatt units, they had the breath guard in this, this U-shape, very tight, and they had a hood. It was a captive air, which means it all, almost all hoods now are demand controlled, which means they only come on when there's heat and or particulate, depending on which brand you buy. This was the kind that needed heat. They had these two units that could 
boil water pretty efficiently and pretty quickly, they were holding chicken on one and making omelets on the other. And the units kept turning off. Why? Well, all induction is pretty much built with a safety that if it gets too hot, it's going to turn off. But the problem was when they pushed the units against the fan, there were actually three problems. When they pushed the units against the, the glass, they blocked the fan. It's important to know where your fan is. They had way too big a unit for what they were doing with it. They did not need 2.9 kilowatts. And because they were only cooking omelets and, and holding food, the, the hood never came on. They weren't generating any heat, so the hood never came on. So they were actually having three different problems that they needed to work on to make it work. And my first suggestion would have been just get those big units out of there and put smaller units in there. You really don't need that big a unit, that powerful a unit for what you're doing with it. But that was a case of where not knowing what, what, what wattage they needed. They just bought a big one. More is better. Tool time, Tim. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to talk to you real quick about two of our units. Um, we brought the Mirage Pro. And the Mirage Cadet, let me get my Vanna here, Bonnie, to show us. Okay, so the Mirage Pro is this one, and she's showing you it over here. And then the Mirage Cadet is the unit next to it. Both are 1,800-watt units. If you were to look at these two cut sheets, front and back, which is what we provide with each unit, you'd say, that Cadet is $250 less, I'm buying that Cadet. But what's the difference? You know, what is the difference? And I've, I've made a big list up here of all the things that are the similar. I mean, you look at them, and, and these will be out here. You can look at them. They look very much the same. So what's the difference? How do I know what 1,800-watt unit is right for me? And it's about a $250 cost difference between the two units. So now we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to get Bonnie to show you some of these things. The Mirage Cadet is a one-switch unit. That probably doesn't mean a lot, but... Um, Instead, it, it affects the one switch affects power, it affects control. It's actually a 75% efficient induction unit, which is not a great efficiency rating for induction. The Mirage Pro is a four switch unit. It has 100 power settings. It is a 95% efficient induction unit, which is what you expect out of, out of induction. But, you know, depending on what your needs are, maybe you don't need such a, a great controlled unit. Maybe you're just making omelets and that cadet is perfect for you. All right, um, and so we talked about one switch, four switch. We've talked about the different power settings. The temperature degrees are a little bit different. The Cadet goes from 100 degrees to 400 degrees. The Pro actually goes from 80 degrees to 400 degrees, which makes it perfect for tempering chocolate because you want to do it right at 80 degrees. And because it's induction, you can set it at 80 degrees and it'll hold it there all day long. You can temper chocolate in that with the Mirage Pro, which you can't do with a cadet. So there's another reason one might make a difference over the other. Um, one has push button controls, only push button controls. The cadet has push button controls, but the Pro actually has a speed dial, so you could roll through the uh, temperature increments. Another important thing is the fan. When you look at the cadet, the fan actually blows out the back. So if you use it in front of a house and you're over here cooking, it's blowing on your customers, which is kind of ooh. But the Pro was designed for front of house, so the fan blows out the bottom. So again, another difference between the two units. The Cadet actually has a plastic bottom, and the Pro has a stainless steel bottom, and then there's the warranty. The Cadet has a one-year warranty, but the Pro, because it's a much better unit, has a two-year warranty. And that might be important to you, too, which warranty, you know, how long are you going to use this unit for? And I would say, of all of our units, the Pro is my favorite, not only because it's a good, it's actually 95% efficient, it's an excellent unit, but it's very versatile. And we have, if, I don't know if Bonnie's gonna be able to reach it, we have this really cute carrying case. You could carry that pro from front of house to back of house, you could carry it on site, off site. Um, it, to, it is actually my favorite unit. If, if I did not need the high power to boil water or do stock pot work, that would be the unit I'd, I'd choose every day. Okay. I just threw this up here. I just This is something that just happened recently, and, and I don't know if Ray wants to talk in any depth about it, but we have had problems recently with some very inexpensive imported cookware coming in that is, it has the plate kind of adhered to the bottom, and it is burning up induction units because it falls off, and it's it's just... This is just a warning we have put out to our sales team, and I'm sharing it with you because we have run into this recently. Be careful. You know, this whole connection is made by the cookware. 
So if you're gonna spend a decent amount of money on this induction unit, buy good cookware. Do you have something? It's part of the circuit. So right. people make the mistake sometimes of buying quality induction from one of our companies, and they will put a really low-end piece of cookware on top. But not just the weight and the gauge affect the cookware, but the weight at the bottom, the level of magnetism on the bottom. Effect. Remember, it's part of the circuit. So don't go buy an induction range in a super, super cheap piece of cookware. You're reducing the effect, and sometimes it does affect efficiency according to what the engineers tell us. Right. Yeah, and I meant to mention that, that the three manufacturers that are here are all very good manufacturers. When you go to your dealer and you find manufacturers, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about with those $100, those $100 import units. Just I'm giving you an owner beware on those, that those $100 import units are interesting. Yeah, and, and I'm not an engineer uh, at her level, but I would say this too, is that I'm a food service guy. I was for 25, 27 years, and I say as we look at induction, induction is not a whole lot different than either electronics in your life. It's probably out here, if we all put our phones in the air, it'd be an iPhone, a, a Samsung. People grasp the importance of having a quality phone, like you would stereo equipment or electronics in your car. Induction's the same thing. So much of what's in that box, the quality of electronics, the quality of the build, the circuit boards, the design, it affects the efficiencies, the power, the longevity, just like quality affects the electronics in your home. So don't, when you look at electronics in the restaurant business, it's the same. You get what you pay for. For every certain level in a quality brand, you're getting what you pay for. So nowadays, you're seeing induction flow into the United States, and everybody's slapping a brand name on induction. Be very careful. It is analogous to you buying technology for your home life. You get what you pay for. And it's, and benefits. it's also important to know that induction is actually high voltage. Um, you know, it, it comes in off of a 120 line, but we convert it from AC to DC, and it is actually high voltage. So it's something just to be aware of. There's a lot of safeties in there, so you don't touch it and get shocked. There's a lot of safeties in there, but induction is actually a high voltage piece. Okay, so um, that, the other part of this presentation was when do I need ventilation? So I've been a designer for, I don't even know how many years now, probably about 15 years. And when induction first came out, there was this magic line at 1,250 watts that if you were above 1,250 watts, you needed a hood. And if you were below 1,250 watts, you did not. I have to be honest with you, that magic line seems to have disappeared. Now it is completely jurisdictional and you definitely have to talk to your local jurisdiction that 300 watt warmer there we had three of them in an assisted living and they wanted a hood over it because we could cook bacon and I made an hour-long video of us trying to cook bacon on a 300 watt unit and I will tell you I put the eggs in 20 minutes after the bacon had been going and at about 45 minutes the eggs started to turn white it's 300 watts there's not any power in it but that that guy would not give in and we ended up pulling them out because it, they're not going to put a hood over 300 watts. That's just insane. But it was a jurisdictional guy that just didn't understand. But on the other side of this, we're here to help you. If you're trying, if you're fighting with your jurisdiction, we have a lot of information on our side where we can help you with the jurisdiction. So um, a good option is the downdraft unit, which my Bonnie is back there again, getting ready to show you. I, I prefer to, we call this the downdraft unit, which is actually the ventilation. I prefer to call it a mobile cooking station. It is built with, it's basically built so you can cook anywhere. You can push this, you can cook in a room with high ceilings, you can cook in a room with low ceilings, you can push it against a wall, you can go outside with this because it has complete fire containment. So it is um, built with two 1400 watt induction hobs, so you can definitely do omelets and finish work on it. Uh, it has the downdraft recirculating vent, which has two filters on the front that go through the dishwasher. Then on the inside, it has a carbon and a particulate filter for smell and to grab that last bit of grease so you don't throw the grease out into the room. It has built-in fire containment. There are actually three Ansel nozzles, two on the front of the unit, one in, we'll call it the ductwork, down inside below the filters. It has fire suppression. It comes completely plumb, so when it shows up, all you have to do is charge it. We can't ship it charged, so it has to be charged locally. It has the glass for fire containment, so if a fire were to start, nothing is going to happen. It's not getting outside that glass. It's induction. It's not going to start a fire. Induction has safeties built in, so it won't catch fire. But if it were to happen, it would definitely be put out very quickly. In fact, I heard about the first discharge of one of our induction units recently. It turned out that somebody decided to put another burner, um, one of those 
butane burners on top of our induction burner and discharge the Ansel. So that's the only time I've ever heard of the Ansel discharging on this thing. And then it's mobile. It's on casters. You know, you can get the finishes. You can't change the size and shape, but you can do anything with the finishes. So it's kind of a neat unit. And you can have right now, the one that Bonnie has is an 18-inch um, guard. Because all of the fuse links, it basically is like a hood, the fuse links, that if they break, just discharge the Ansel. All that's underneath the stainless steel. We can't really get rid of that piece. But then above, you can raise it to 22 inches. That has also been through all the certifications. And then you could, um, for a taller person, you have a little bit better line of sight onto your pants. They're all 120 volts, 30 amps, so it's pretty easy. You do need a special NEMA, so if you are going to use it in different places, that does require a little bit of planning. Um, it, but it also, there are ways to do different things. You can also order it with one hob, and then you can have a 20 amp, so it'll work on a 520p, which is standard almost everywhere. I can't see any plugs here to see what we have, but it's standard almost anywhere. And the coolest thing about this is if it's not put together right, it won't work, which is something the EPA wants to see that they can, you can't sort of put it together and then it'll release grease into the air because that's kind of what they're worried about is releasing grease into the air. So if it's not assembled correctly, it really doesn't release grease into the air. And then those carbon particulate filters, the, uh, the, the outside filters could just go through the dishwasher, they're stainless steel. But the inside filters, we tell everybody it's about six months, but honestly, it depends on how greasy of food you're cooking, of how often you have to replace those. Yeah, these just look like a regular hood filter. And just like a regular hood filter, you can run them straight through the dishwasher. So these are all the ratings it has. And I, again, I don't want to be too geeky, but UL197 is the cooking, the heat rating. UL710B is the downdraft rating. EPA test method 202 is the grease particulate rating. The NFPA96 is the fire suppression that it will actually discharge and damp the fire out. NSF2 is the breath guard, and uh, did I just mess that up? NSF2 is, yeah, that's the breath guard, and then NSF4 is for all commercial cooking, whether you're uh, rethermalizing or holding. It's a fully rated unit. It's really kind of difficult to get this test, and our engineers, if they were up here, would probably humor you with some of the stories of trying to get all these ratings. So we are we boiling water, or are we not boiling water? We were go trying to recreate this demo of boiling water over here so that you can actually, you can come up later and look and just see that the, the steam and the, the, particular, the stuff that's coming out of that pot just goes right into the downdraft. And that's kind of what this picture shows, that it comes up. We have a thermographic of it too. You see the heat is in the bottom, again, because it's induction, that red area is the heat. That center area where it's white, that's right on top of the burner. And then the pink that's going up into the vents is showing where the heat is going up into the vents. It's not going all around. And then I like to show this to pass with, to pass this um, the the fire suppression test. We had to cook for eight hours, 300 burgers, a 70 30, 30 percent fat. You can't even buy that. You have to have that ground to do this test. And at the end of the day, you, there are these tiny little cups that the EPA is collecting the grease in. You really can't have more than a fingerprint of smudge. That's how efficient this is at reducing grease. And then of course. Um, this is the fire suppression test where, and I hope I have the video embedded, although I don't see it. Can you see if the video is embedded in here for me? Because I wouldn't know how to start the video anyway. But there's a video embedded in here. It's kind of neat. We had to slathe this unit with lard, and then it had to catch, it had to catch fire. We, um, we couldn't set it on fire. So we had to rig the induction so it would get hot enough to catch fire, and then it had to go, it burns, it burns until it breaks those fuse links, and there's a five second delay, and then it dumps the Ansel. And it's pretty impressive. We had to do it with two different pans, a two inch, it should dump any second now, and a, and a two inch, a little short pan, and a tall pan. And the two inch had like one inch of grease, that tall pan had like two inches of grease. We had to do both. It had to put out the fire for both types of pans. So it's pretty impressive when you think about all the, the technology and all the thought went into this unit. Had to cook eight, I'm sorry, we had to cook for UL. They made us cook eight half pound, 30% fat hamburger patties continuously for eight hours straight without a failure or filter change. So they, they did not want the unit to pass. We had this ready to go about a year, year and a half before we got certification because UL said we've never seen something like this. Mm -hmm. They don't feel comfortable with it. And they, it, so it's an extreme test. And actually, they said you couldn't even empty the pan of grease until the unit shut off because they wanted to see that the unit would shut off when it got clogged. 
which is basically when it will shut off. If you don't clean it, it will shut off, or if you don't change the filters, or it won't start, depending on where, how you're starting it. So that was really all I prepared. Um, we'll be here later this afternoon. You guys are welcome to come over and ask us any questions you have. And I might have gone through that way faster than I was supposed to. But I do also have these cut sheets just to give you an idea of how, it is sometimes very difficult, but it's really good to talk to your manufacturers. We know our equipment, and we will definitely help you get to did the right piece. Did you want to comment real quick if you got off the stage? Oh, yeah, I didn't mention the drop-in, did I? So this is our newest piece of equipment, and I had it actually in a slide that I probably breezed over super fast. It is an induction drop-in, which means now you can hold food. At a, I'm going to say precise, but it's in five-degree increments, a precise temperature. 140 to 190. Yeah, 140 to 190. We have two different um, power sources inside there. They'd adjust from, a, you can use a two inch or a four inch pan, so it adjusts to accommodate either size pan, either a half or a whole. And um, it has two control panels. You can actually hold, like say you're doing spaghetti, you can hold pasta in the front at 140, which is the low end of that spectrum, but hold sauce in the back at 165 or 170, because you might want to retherm that pasta a little bit. So it's a very versatile unit in how it works. And, and I'll tell you, if you're, I'm not a tech guy, but I am a food guy, and I will say that. The, you know, you think about low, what does low, medium, and high mean, right? doesn't mean a whole lot. So forever in a steam table, what we've suffered from in this industry is steam-generated heat, which was effective. But you may have – look at Mexican food. You may have uh, cheese enchiladas in the front that need to be held at 158, right, or one, 150. And you may have beans in the back at 190. So as operators, you're always struggling with that, balancing food in the steam table. And why do we make food continuously through the day in an operation? Because of the elapsed time, right? The time with which you know that food's perfect, at which time you know you shouldn't be serving any longer. And so many times we've struggled, always in this business, of living with the equipment we're stuck with. This unit has the ability to actually read and temp the pan. Don't you think about that? So from 140 to 190 in five degree increments, you, the chef, is telling the pan what temperature you want it to be. So a, a fish in a delicate cream sauce can sit at 145 for hours without killing it. That's the power of this induction. So you're literally controlling them. We think it's going to absolutely, we can talk about energy savings. We're going to talk about water savings. We're going to talk about all these things that are very important. But as David said in the beginning, I think the harder thing to quantify is what really matters most to you. You're in an environment where your customers expect perfection, don't they? If it's not cold and crisp or hot and fresh, they're brutal nowadays. They're unforgiving. This kind of technology does more than provide energy for you. We think from the operator perspective, once you install this equipment, you're going to have far longer elapsed times, fresher food, better control on product. That's going to have a greater impact on your operation than even the energy savings. So both are really, really important. In the nice size, it's, it's, it is the exact same size as our hot well. So whether you have one pan, two pans, three pans, six pans, it's very easy to retrofit. So if you did have a hot well right now, I mean, each manufacturer's cutout's a little bit different, but ours is, we made all of our hot wells the exact same size. So it's very easy to retrofit. And, and, and we talked about the soup wells a little bit too. And, and if you focus on the soup well technology that you're literally, I'm with the food guy's perspective, I'm gonna now be able to control temperature from 100 to 190 degrees. Think about that, 90 degrees, I can now tell the vessel what I want in it. So we went to the LA show two years ago and we had a couple large chains approach us, hey, we wanna see this. We put a can of cheap cheese sauce queso in this unit, set it at 158. We held it from Sunday morning at 10 a.m., 24 seven to Tuesday afternoon at five. Now all you know that cheese sauce gums up in about four or five hours, right? Then you as an operator are thinking, okay, do I serve it, right? Or do I scrap it? So what happens, this held for three days. At the end of three days, there was about an inch of water missing. We had a Put some water in it. We dumped it out in the garbage can. It had about a dime's worth of scorch on the side. It was servable, folks. And think about the power of that on your food cost. So yes, everything this center teaches is energy is so critically important. You got to get water out. You got to get power out. What you've got to start doing is lowering your food cost, right? Serving a more perfect product. And these type of technologies will do that for you. Because think about that. We're now temping the pan. Right. Cream sauces, all the things that break. You know, all my history in the food service business, you've been around a long time, you're remaking food throughout the day. You have to, or you lose customers. These technologies are very, very powerful when you're telling the pan what's in it. And then one more comment on the downdraft unit. If any of you in a resorts or hotels or catering, right? Neat thing about that unit, and if I, you were in a hotel, I could meet you in the front of the hotel and I could saute something for you. 
We could fall to your room if we didn't freak you out. We could cook something there. <laughs> we can pull it out to the pool bar. You're not going to feed 300 people on it, but what I can do is wheel it in line because what do the customers want nowadays? They want live action, right? Back to fresh. They want live action, want things prepared in front of them. That's why these things are selling so good because it not only allows you to cook live, even for a big event where you're not feeding everybody off the unit, but then this can move everywhere from a boardroom. And you hear the sound of it? You're going to hear the fan, but part of the design was to keep that noise down. So if I wheel into a boardroom or a small meeting with 12 people, you can talk over it. So great technologies, but think of that application of how you're going to make money. Right. right. Lower your food costs and please your customers in an environment that's really brutal for you right now, isn't it, with what customers expect? Well, water. Hands on. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the other neat thing with almost all of these induction burners is when they're working, you can touch the corner. Don't go near the pan. That's hot, at least with ours, because we're more of a front of house company. I'm not going to say that for the other two because they have these huge wattage units and you probably could get burned. But with ours, these front of house units are very safe. Even if you have little kids touching the uh, on that drop in that outside rim, it doesn't get hot. And, you uh, can almost lift the pan out without any towel. And one of the biggest battles you face today is labor. I don't need to tell you that, right? Labor is a train wreck nationwide. It's very, very hard. Uh, we, a lot of us worked in the past, worked in 100-degree under-conditioned kitchens in New Orleans. 120. We accepted that in the past. They won't accept it now. So induction does, as David said, it lowers. Really important what he talked about today. Finding help is tough, all right? Keeping help when you have, you know, it's not as hot, it's cooler. That makes a difference. It really does. Yeah, I, I apprenticed with a chef for three years when I was 18 in South Florida. We would go outside in the 90-something degree heat to cool off. It was at least 120 in that kitchen. They didn't have the cool vents like they have to do it now. They didn't believe in air conditioning. It's it's so much different now, and this is only going to help with having induction because it gets that heat where it belongs in the food, not all over. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, well, we're getting uh, Dan all wired for sound. Um, I'd just like to introduce him. So uh, we'll, our next speaker is is uh, Dan from Cook Tech. Uh, he is the general manager of Cook Tech. He's been at Middleby. Uh, Middleby Company since 2013. Uh, prior to that, he had a long history working on the service side of the business, so he's really seen the good, the bad, and the ugly about what really goes on in the in the back of the house and how and how to be how to fix it. Um, and he's also had a lot of end user operator experience working for Burger King, Applebee's, and others. So, um, really looking forward to listening to, to what Dan has to say and sharing what new innovations Cook Tech has to offer. And so, let's please welcome Dan. Thank you. All right, is this on? What happened to that break? <laughs> Quite all right. Well, welcome. Uh, again, thanks, David and uh, Frontier Energy for putting this uh, symposium on, and to Volrath and Garland for bringing your staff and time and effort here to, to share with everybody. And uh, keep this open. If you've got questions, I know it's been pretty quiet, probably done a lot of absorbing. But if there's questions out here, we've got great personnel that will hopefully address whatever you have in mind when it comes to induction. Some of the things we're going to be talking on from, from our standpoint, uh, a little bit of induction or uh, introduction again on induction. We'll go through some uh, basics, some of the advantages of induction in your kitchens. A uh, little bit on the electrical requirements, what you want to think about setting yourself up for uh, from an installation standpoint, some of the unique capabilities of what induction can offer your kitchens, and some applications beyond cooking. And that's some of the unique things that I think you'll see induction go into. It's it's even more than just your kitchen where we can take induction. Uh, from a cook tech standpoint, we'll go over a product line. We have four different product mixes. We're going to have a countertop cooking, very familiar, uh, a heavy duty, maybe a little less familiar, a little more back of the house focused, a warming and holding application, and then a delivery segment as well, which has been a big buzzword right now. Uh, so many companies are going to the delivery market, so we'll spend a little time on that uh, in case you're into those types of applications. And some myths or some uh, myth busting and some of the misfires. So again, we, I saw hardly any hands go up on the induction piece, and I think Boer did a good job of kind of diving into some of that. Uh, we'll get a little bit techy on here, and if I need to pitch it back to uh, Dr. Sean back there, uh, he's our uh, director of engineering, he may help us out on some of the induction pieces as well. But I think we're familiar with how a, uh, a, uh, a turbine works where you're spinning a magnetic field at a very high velocity, it's going to create an alternating electrical current. That's going to give you your power source. Induction works kind of backwards. We're going to take a very fast, high-frequency alternating electrical current and create that magnetic current. And this is uh, one of the pieces that shows that happening. 
And these are some of the regular applications of that. Like I mentioned, the, the turbine, uh, any kind of electrical power generation, transformers. And again, what we're doing with induction is, is the same principle. We're just kind of reversing the game. And what that allows us to do is create that eddy current and that alternating magnetic current. And that's going to create the transformer action causing the electric to flow through the pan. And so you're going to get some of those resistive losses. So if you have a strong resistive elements in that pan, that energy is going to stay in the pan. Uh, the other thing we're going to get out of that is something called, and I think it might be on the next slide, hysteretic loss. And that's because, you know, we talked about a little bit about having the, the right type of pan and having some magnetic properties in that pan. And that's important because the hysteretic loss, by having that uh, alternating magnetic field that's causing the uh, molecules to reverse polarity at a very rapid rate, you're going to get that friction buildup in the pan. So along with the resistive loss, you have the additional hysteretic loss. So that's why there's going to be a little bit of different variance pan to pan on what you're going to find uh, your induction is going to be capable of. So even though you might have a 3,500 watt burner, you might only realize 2,800 watts of that depending on the vessel that you use. And it's something to be mindful of as you go into the marketplace and specify out all these induction pieces is, you know, if they're looking at 3,500 watts to boil pasta in a very, you know, expedient manner, do you have the right cookware to match that uh, perception for the, for the customer and, and what they're looking for? And, and to that point, we talk about the, the ferrous materials are going to heat the best because uh, they have the hysteretic loss. Steel, iron, relatively poor conductors, that's good for induction, right? Because that's going to trap that resistive energy and keep that in the pan. Um, anybody hear about uh, aluminum pans being able to be inducted? Does that come to mind? There is technology out there that will do that. The problem is it's very inefficient because, again, aluminum is an excellent conductor of energy. So a lot of that resistive loss passes right through. You don't get that benefit from an induction capability. And you have to use a much higher frequency to generate some of those uh, resistive and uh, magnetic losses or hysteretic loss. Because of that, there's certain uh, situations where it can actually cause the pan to float off the burner if you go to those types of applications that try to induct other metals. So there is some on the marketplace. It's a good 20 to 30% less efficient than what you're going to find from the standard induction companies that you find here. So something to be mindful of as you, as you look into a induction market because, again, like uh, I think I can't remember if it was uh, Ray or Catherine I mentioned earlier, that pan or that vessel is the complete circuit. That completes your circuit for induction. So definitely be mindful of that regardless of the application you look for from induction. Uh, other practical induction areas that you might have seen before, uh, if you've ever been to the hospital, visit somebody that's sick or ill, or something of that nature, you see them when they get their food carts and they have that little covered dish on there. That's actually an inductive dish in most cases. Some of it uses electrical elements to keep that heat in there. But in most cases, it's going to be induction-based. And they're inducting the graphite, and it has some uh, thermal layers in there that will gently release that heat over a period of time. So that graphite's an excellent uh, conductor for induction. Uh, also, a silver film would be would be applicable as well. It's a relatively old technology. I know David had referenced that as a, a new technology. It's new to us. Okay, induction has been very common in, in Europe, and I think that learning curve that uh, yeah, I think you'll find a lot of the manufacturers talking about that teaching back of the house employees how to utilize induction because there is a little bit of a learning curve. The speed is so rapid when you put that pan on that burner that you can scorch products very quickly if you're not mindful of bringing that power up slowly, OK? It's instantaneous. We're going to boil water right now, depending on how much power you're using. Um, but it has been around for a long period of time. I think as the US uh, market gets more acclimated to induction, they'll get more comfortable with the cooking applications. But think about where some of the companies are taking induction. You know, you mentioned there with the hot wells and soup warmers, where the, the technology of induction is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is it's better energy saving, and you can use it without having to understand a different technology. So we're taking induction into very market-specific applications where you don't have to rethink how to cook. And I think that's important, and that's where you're going to have success in a lot of the US market is looking at those types of applications. Just a typical look of something underneath the hood, something to be mindful of. Uh, induction uses a lot of high-voltage electronics, OK? so. If you have a kitchen that has a lot of high humidity or a lot of high temperature, again, induction is trying to take you out of those situations with the humidity or the temperature application. But 
it's not a great idea to put one of our induction units right between a charboiler, a gas charboiler, and maybe a, a, a gas griddle, okay? Because you're gonna have a lot of high temperatures. That does have a tendency because you need that air circulation in those electronics to run into a situation where it'll fail on a, on a heat warning. Now, typically, most induction is built in with safety, so it's not gonna fail overall. It'll shut itself off until you can remedy that environmental situation and bring those heat conditions down. So most of the induction you'll see in the marketplace, at least from uh, more of the reputable companies, Again, you get what you pay for. Um, we'll have some of those safeties built in, so you're not losing that investment. But it is mindful, or important to be mindful, that this is your engine here. And your engine's gonna you know, give you performance based on how well you treat it in its operational environment. Uh, different manufacturers will have different tolerances to temperature as well. So something you can look for in uh, spec sheets and uh, uh, some of the information that the manufacturers will give out that will help you specify certain equipment depending on what kind of operating conditions it's going to be in. I feel like I'm racing through this and everyone's going to get in glazed eyes. Any questions on, on the induction science at all? Um, you, hopefully you'll be experts by the end of this because I'm learning some stuff even going through somebody else's presentations as well. Uh, so again, your inverter is going to turn power into high frequency. It's going to deliver it uh, in the inductive coil and it's going to transfer through hysteretic loss and resistive heating into your pan. And that's about as perfect as you get. You're transferring 100% of that energy or close to it directly into the pan. Um, but we do face some challenges, okay? So there's gonna be a lot of variability in product quality. Uh, you're gonna hear that messaging time and again. Um, we have people that, that spend a little bit more time and, and effort into engineering a, a piece of equipment that's gonna withstand the rigors of your kitchens. So be mindful of that. Uh, Perfect example of the broad range of feature and functionalities of different control sets that you'll see. Uh, you'll see heritage design that's going to mirror some of the back of the house where it's just a knob. You turn it on, it's got a very similar look and feel. And you're going to find a lot of capacitive touch and uh, you know, touch screen applications that'll be a little bit more modern. Something that's going to be tuned into maybe the next generation of uh, culinary coming into the back of the house. So be mindful of your interfaces and your user interfaces as you select your induction equipment. But it has come of age. Um, the cost is beginning to come down a little bit. Energy costs are coming up. So that uh, kind of that value proposition that you're giving to your customer about letting them know about the return on investment. Here's why we're going to try to use induction in this application because we're expected to get our ROI in under a year. Those are real conversations you can have today. And I think uh, Frontier Energy does a great job of capturing some of that data and sharing it with you. Use that data. Digest that data, deliver it to the people that you're trying to specify that equipment into, and you're going to have a very good end result when they build their kitchens, and they're going to be kind of your voice on the street a year or two later talking about, you know, I went and put all this induction in, and here's what I've realized and from a savings standpoint. There's a great story to be told here, and the data is being aggregated. Um, I think, like I said, David, I think you guys do a great job here. So, Speed. Uh, if you want to talk about horsepower, induction is going to get you there. And there are different applications. Uh, you've got the, the front house applications where you're going to have more buffet warming or, or light duty cooking. Uh, again, speed's great there as well. Uh, it's going to transfer the energy immediately. You throw a sterno under there, you've got to wait for that gas to kind of build up the temperature. You've got to figure out how far or how, how close you want to get to the pan to dial in the temperature. You don't have to do that with induction. We're going to detect the temperature of the pan and dial it in exactly where you want to. And all that energy is going right to the pan. I'm not wasting that coming out the side. Okay. So the speed is going to be very applicable as well. When I get that pan of temperature, I turn it on. I'm going to be there. Uh, control is going to be very reactive. If you haven't had a chance to see how fast the control is, uh, when we get a chance to go into the culinary kitchen there, uh, we've got a brazier pan on one of our 7,000 watt stock ranges. And you're going to boil water right now. So, and the beautiful thing is when you turn the power off, there's none of that conductive heat or a radiant heat left in that pan pushing that heat in, you can stop your boil immediately. So if you're doing a delicate product that you need to monitor or manage that temperature and drop it right down to a simmer immediately when you hit boil, like a fish broth or something of that nature, induction is about the best application to get you there. Uh, and, and the precision as well. Uh, when you dial in directly to a temperature, you can't get more precise than that. I'm not trying to figure out what flame to get to. I just dial in where I want to go and get cooking. So it's an easy technology to acclimate yourself to once you understand how precise it is. A great slide, and I, I loved your guys with a little bit more of the, the GIF presentation that shows how much different it is 
when you're talking about inductive heat versus a radiant or, con or convected heat. It's the pan. The pan is your source of energy. It's not gas or, or an electric coil that's transferring maybe 30, 40, or 50 percent. You're getting it all of it, almost all of it into the pan. The only thing you're losing is maybe a little bit of a, the uh, electrical generation losses, where you're, you're talking 5 percent, maybe a, a 60 watt light bulb is about your energy loss on, on most induction applications. So you're able to really utilize all that energy. And I think, I can't remember exactly where that slide is. There it is. So even a little bit of differentiation between an electrical element that's underneath this piece of glass versus an electrical coil that's directly in contact with your pan, you're going to have a variance there on the amount of loss that you have. But regardless of the application, whether it's gas, radiant, electric, or induction, induction is by far the most efficient of the, of the bunch. Very green energy. Uh, I think that kind of goes without saying here when you're trying to sell that type of a, uh, application. Um, if, if green's on the mind, you're going to be there. But the safety piece as well. Um, then I'm going to keep, you know, bouncing back to other presentations when you talk about some of the concerns operating the back of the house. Uh, from a safety standpoint, most of your burns are going to come from. If you've ever worked back of the house, anybody? Okay, so you spent some time. You felt some hot pants before. I have very delicate hands, um, so I'm trying to get in there. At some time, to take tongs and try to get in there and pull that pan up and just touch it on the side because it's really hot. We have some pans actually fired up to 190 degrees back there. I can grab those on the side, change them, put a new one back in because with our hot wells and, and things like soup warmers that utilize induction, I'm just sending the energy into the food. That's where I want that energy to be spent. I don't want to waste that energy and send it all the way up the pan where I'm going to burn myself or utilize that water and steam that's going to you know, burn off to the atmosphere and all those, uh, those watts just flying through and, and going through your ventilation. I'm dedicating the power to the pan, so it's a very safe technology. Uh, they mentioned something about the cooking vessel limitations. Uh, I think that was a great uh, uh, slide as well when you saw the burning of the one pan. Your pans are going to make a difference. Um, I, I think I mentioned that before. Just a little bit of a, a review on that. So be mindful of the vessels that you're using. There's also some pans on the market that are very poorly made, and they will generate a little bit of harmonics. And harmonics is going to be the, the noise that some induction can make. And from, from lesser manufacturers, you can even get induction that, that will make a high-pitched sound, almost like a dog whistle, where you might walk in and be just fine. And when a family comes in with their children, they're going to be like this and saying, we got to leave. That's a real-world application. The, the frequency of the noise are so high-pitched, you're not going to hear it. Somebody else might. And that's going to go into the quality and time that some of the manufacturers of induction spend manufacturing equipment as well as the cookware that you use completing the circuit. So it's going to vibrate some of those met or metallic uh, molecules that can make a high pitch depending on how, how good the quality is of the pan. Um, let's move on to this. Y your power is going to vary and, and all manufacturers do a good job of letting you know what your amp draw is going to be. Again, as you're setting up those, the, the power consideration and specifying equipment, remember the complete circuit. Okay? If you're going to put in 3,500 watts, make sure you've got the, the, the marriage of the rest of the equation to utilize that 3,500 watts. And sorry, I'm skipping over a lot of this because I think it's somewhat redundant. If there's something that I pass up, stop me in my tracks. Um, Cook Text product line, uh, some of it's going to be familiar applications. We'll have the front of the house pieces. Uh, like you see on the cooktops or the other walk ranges. We also do get into the back of the house, and you'll see more and more manufacturers in the North American market getting there. I think if you look at European and Asian markets, they're already there. And uh, to, I guess, to a little bit of jealousy, they have a little bit more diversity of, uh, of, of market and of availability of product for, for some of these applications. But that's going to be mo introduced more and more into the, the North American market as time goes on. Um, warming and holding is going to be another product mix, and you're going to see a lot of great product here that's going to be anything from chafer holding to soup warming to, to any kind of hotel pan. And then delivery. Uh, again, I'm going to kind of fly through some of the product line because you're going to see some of it here, but I just want to see a little bit of a breadth of, of some of what's out there in the marketplace. When you get your, your countertops, there is a difference depending on what kind of power you want and what kind of feature set you want and what kind of warranty there is, and on and on. Uh, be mindful of what you're specifying in, in your applications. And we're going to have countertop, drop-in. You can build your own induction suite. Most manufacturers have drop-in applications. So you can go to a custom fab shop, build what you want to give to that customer. Uh, 
again, being mindful of, of ventilation, and if there's going to be fire suppression needed, you have to be mindful of that as well. Um, there are some great offerings out there for mobile suites, but you can also look into a, a kind of getting that suite and building in what piece of equipment you want to. Do not put the gas burners in your custom suites. That's a fantastic story. We spend time actually engineering this to utilize for specific induction applications. Um, and then the heavy duty side, again, you're going to see more and more of this coming to the back of the house. Much more efficient, very high powered, great application here. You got a, a, a pasta application uh, that you want to boil water quickly or you're, you're holding a bunch of soups in, a, in a, a, a water bath. If you're doing anything with water or you need speed and high power, any of these heavy duty ranges are going to get you there. Uh, I think David already touched on, on one of the, uh, some of the reporting that's out there. Great resources. Um, one of those we had here was already brought up by David, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But the application with the hot wells, again, when you tell a customer that I don't need to worry about installing drains anywhere or uh, having my, cut or my uh, back of house employees have to pour water into my pans every two to three hours or every shift, that really does help your operation. That takes a lot off their minds so they can focus on delivering great food to their customer without having to worry about how the back of house employees have to mine the equipment. And if you're not having to worry about drains, that becomes a portable, a portable hot, hot holding area. Um, if you need to move that, I'm not having to gut all the drains. I can do a fairly you know, small mod or a modification and put that wherever I need it to go, because it's plug and play. Heavy duty planches. Uh, these are great pieces, again, because of the power and speed. OK? What, you, you know this piece? You want one. OK. Why? gas kitchen can we convert to induction and how can we take our, our creations mm -hmm. and our menus and apply it. Thank you. How do we take um, what we want to do and what we want to deliver to our customers and, and convert from a back of the house point of view using this technology right. and have the same efficiency? What I'm most interested in is, is the safety, uh, the time, and, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, how do I avoid having to uh, uh, to expand a massive hood system to take an existing back of the house pro uh, uh, project. Great That's point. Yeah. Caution. Induction does not necessarily mean ventless. This much power, you're going to want under a hood. And you're going to see some other pieces of equipment that induction can really deliver a lot of power. Um, you're going to want that under a hood. But more to your point, on the safety side and as far as the, the speed of, of induction, this unit here, uh, a typical 36-inch grill is going to take if you've got talking gas, you might need 25 to 30 minutes to start that up to get it up to temperature because you have to soak that thick plate with energy because you want to be mindful of the recovery rate as you're cooking proteins. Something like this, I'm at 350 degrees in just over four minutes. I'm at 525 degrees in under nine minutes. So if I forget to start my equipment up and it's 15 minutes till we open the doors, I'm not in trouble, okay? If I do that in a different application with gas, I lose the first four or five tickets that are out the door. It's more for the uh, recording than it is for. Got it. Can you sear? At 525 degrees? No, I can, you can sear it, but the actual application, the actual physical application, okay. can you sear on that unit? Do you need a specific searing surface? Um, you know, is it well, okay, so different plate technologies. I mean, we chrome plate some of our griddles. Uh, we have a, a polished steel. We also have a grooves plate. You're going to find different manufacturers utilizing different materials. To be able to do that, but absolutely you can. So sear. you can take your protein and put it directly onto the surface. If For you this, yeah. yes, because a, a, a situation like this, and you'll see uh, Paul with Garland. They have a brazing pan in the back that, if you think about that pan or this griddle plate or the plancha plate, it is basically your pan. It's just permanent, right? I'm not taking it on and off. You're inducting straight onto that plate. So your answer is, yeah, you can sear. You can do anything you want to that you would have done in a pan. This is just a big pan. Perfect. That's all it is. And in other applications, you'll see where you can take a countertop unit and actually put a cast iron plate on there and be able to sear on that as well. Be mindful, though, if you put that heavy load on there, there's something in induction called dry panning, where if you fire up that hot iron, you can get reflected radiant heat that'll go into the, the, the induction unit and potentially shut that down from a high heat warning. Most induction that you're going to find in the market from uh, more reliable manufacturers will have protections built in. 
So again, it's not going to kill your unit. It's just going to temporarily shut it down. But you get a lot of customers that, uh, somebody that wants to fire up Indian spices and kind of release the, the, the nose of it, um, they, they call us and say, hey, my, my induction keeps shutting down. It's like, well, what are you doing? And we have to kind of walk through that process of, okay, if you're going to do that, don't leave that pan fired up the entire time. If you're going to you know, fire your spices, put them in the pan, put it on. When you're done, take that pan off. Don't leave that on there in a dry fire application that you're going to continuously send that radiant heat back into your cavity. So there's a little bit of the education process on that. Did I get your question? Excellent. Correct. You use it exactly as you would use a gas or a gas plancha, except the engine is different. Correct. And that's where, you know, we talked. I talked a little bit earlier about being more application specific with induction, and not having to relearn how to cook. That's where these applications are going to be so beneficial. So yes, it's going to work just like any other plancha or griddle. You turn it on, you turn on the temperature you want to or the power setting, and you go about your day. The great thing about induction is, again, if you've had a, a gas griddle and you've loaded up with burgers. Let's say I'm a five guys and I'm throwing burgers left and right. There's a recovery period for that. Typically, it's going to be anywhere from, you know, it can be one minute. What's, what's some long recoveries that you've seen, David, on a griddle? On uh, a griddle, I've seen as long as 15 minutes to get back up to temperature. Okay. So, again, if I'm taking frozen proteins and putting them on that griddle, going from frozen to, to the finished product, I'm pulling all the energy out of that plate that I spent all that time soaking. With induction, my recovery rate is right now. Okay, I take burgers off there and we barrel loaded these. Uh, they did a good job for us as well. They tested one of our planches. And uh, even though I boast instantaneous, he still told me I took like 45 or 50 seconds. I challenged that and I'm gonna get you another one. But, you know, their testing process, they have to go edge to edge and they have a very thorough testing process. So certainly you can rely on, on the, you know, Dave's work out there. But again, we're not talking, you know, three, five, 10 minutes. We're talking maybe an extra five to 10 seconds on your cook cycle because I'm already back up to a cookable temperature, okay? So induction is gonna deliver a much different cooking experience in, in specific applications. The planche is a perfect example of that. You're gonna see our stock pot range back there. Again, the very heavy duty unit, 7,000 kilowatts, or uh, 7,000 watts, my apologies, 7,000 kilowatts would be a pretty heavy, heavy duty unit. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to hook up that type of a, a power connection to a restaurant, so. But again, utilizing very high power, driving it into whatever application you want to. Stock pots is gonna be the, the normal application, but I can put a brazier pan on there too, do peppers and onions all day long in a different environment and keep going about my day. Um, one of the things that, that induction can do as well, and you'll see some of this in the marketplace, is because I, I have a magnetic wave that's basically my energy transfer to my pan, I can pitch it through solid surfaces. You're going to see this come on more and more as time goes on. Uh, we're experimenting right now with cooking directly on stone, um, setting the pan on stone and doing cooking applications. Right now, we focus on buffet because it's a little bit lower power, and you're not driving a lot of that energy back into that stone or, or corian or quartz. Um, and that's been a great application for buffet because we can pitch that power directly through a solid surface and keep a chafer at 180, 190 degrees. Okay, so induction can take you into different applications that traditional technologies would not have done before. Um, again, this is the way that we transfer the energy. We're not using radiant, we're not conducting the heat. It's inductive. Um, we also have a traditional buffet warmers, which I, I think you, you've seen in the past. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this one. Spend some time looking at these hot wells that are here. It is a great application for, for back of the house for front of the house, for however you want to use your hot wells. The energy savings are there. It's a, it's a short putt. Uh, we now are into the, we had a soup well before that. Um, in our infinite wisdom, when we came out with our hot wells, uh, we had a, a soup well that you would use a bain-marie with. So you would induct that water instead of using gas or electric. We'd induct the water, and then the water would transfer the energy onto the side of the pans. We are now more into a, a more traditional induction soup application where we're strictly inducting the terrine. There's no water application, so it's waterless. Um, and, and what's great is, you know, I think Volrath Garland and I could play table tennis all day long on different products and applications. What's great is, is the manufacturers now are driving each other to bring more innovations and technologies in their marketplace. So now more than ever, you have that selection and diversity in product that you can go out and look at and test and demo and specify. And we'll continue to drive each other uh, years from now. 
So you're going to see more and more product going in, but now it's going to be that blending of product and you're going to have, you know, I'm not just going to have like a one source. We're all going to kind of drive each other to continue to improve those technologies, which I think is really important, especially now. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a little bit outside the box is if you consider the delivery. Again, is anybody running into delivery conversations with end users? Uh, and I, again, I apologize. I don't know the diversity of, of you know, people that we have here in the audience. But I'm sure you've heard of the Uber Eats, the you know, Amazon's getting into the game, Grubhub, Delivery Internationally. It's a huge conversation. And the one thing that none of them are able to do is really take heat with the bag. And, and uh, one of the places that we're trying to take induction, which is a little bit novel, is into a segment where we actually induct the energy into a transferable heat source. So you can take the heat with you. Um, and we've got applications in the back. Uh, certainly when you walk around, stop by. I want to show you what one of these pellets looks like. But it, it's not so much that we have this product offering. It's how you can take induction as a technology into different market segments and, and be a little more flexible of, from your mindset of, of where you can take this application. I'm transferring energy from one source to another. I'm releasing it over a period of time. So 45 minutes later, I can take pizza uh, from one area to another, especially if I'm in like Minnesota or something like that, even Wisconsin. I heard it's cold up there. And I can keep that heat density in the product. And I can be up to a 20 to 30 degree temperature differential Fahrenheit when I get from point A to point B if it's over 30 minutes. Um, it's a big deal. And induction is one way that we can kind of take the cords away from heat and deliver that heat wirelessly. Um, we, we talked about this. And uh, Roger, if we can click on that and go to the, the point that I saw there. Who's heard of Allclad? Cookware, all clad, it's the best, right? Everybody loves all clad. So what we did is we have a, a testing, because we want to test our philosophy out there. Why do you get into cookware? Um, there's a lot of cookware in the marketplace. Boy, that's loud. Let's see if you can pause it. Can you pause that, Roger? And then jump to 254. Keep going. So we took our tri-fly versus their tri-fly. Ah, it's going to, that's all right. Is that, no, go to 254. There we go. Thank you. So there is variance. And when we looked at this, you know, we wanted to make sure that from an induction standpoint, if we're going to put a, uh, our stamp in the game, we're going to have a pan that had a very high level induction. So one of the pieces that we have, uh, an app unit, and I apologize, I don't have that here to show you, actually does a pan characterization. It will tell you how efficient that pan is. In other words, what percentage of the watts that you're trying to deliver will be accepted by that pan. And what we found with Allclad was it accepted about 85% of the eddy current, and the CookTech pan accepts closer to 100%. And you'll find a very different experience when you're trying to boil two cups of water. And this is probably painfully slow. I wish I had a fast forward button. Um, I think you did a decent job of, of driving this down. I apologize. We just got our hands on this video yesterday. So this is a 2,500 watt or a 5,000 watt, two burners, 2,500 watts each. Uh, and I won't bore you with the fact that we switched the pans to make sure one burner wasn't faster than the other. But in a very short period of time, you can see where that percentage if I can capture 100% versus 85%, I'm 15% faster coming to a boil. Now think of that in an application in the back of the house. I'm 15% faster cooking. That means 15% faster ticket times. That means I can get through 15% more people through my, through my uh, whatever venue I have, 15% more money in your pocket. So having that vessel to take that energy, receive it, and put it in the marketplace is a very important piece. Thanks, Roger. So something to be mindful of. And again, I, if I had the Apogee unit, uh, I'd be happy to show you. We didn't get out of here. Let's see if we can dump back in. OK, so we did come out with a line of tri-ply cookware just because we wanted to showcase that there is a difference. Um, so be mindful of, of the cookware or whatever vessel you're using in that induction piece. Power, efficiency, precision. Um, I'm going to try to wrap some of this up here because a lot of this is going to be redundant. Um, there's some myths here about, you talked about, can I get a good sear? Uh, we actually have some of that in the presentation about the searing piece. Um, you know, slower methods are going to allow the, uh, the uh, 
take the partially steam, you're going to get that, that power right away. So it's going to be a great product for searing. Um, you don't have to spend a lot, of, a lot of money on special induction pans. You might spend a little bit more than a base aluminum pan. But again, uh, those costs have been coming down over time. And I think there's a little bit more of a, a breadth of, of product line out there now to choose from. You do have to be mindful that, you know, I think any kind of ply pan is going to be a good application. You'll see some clad pans on the marketplace as well. Um, depending on how they're cladding, it can be a very, a very good pan for you. Uh, some of it's going to be trial and error, but I would certainly look at uh, um, how magnetic that pan is. And, and if there is a pan characterization piece, if you've got questions, we can do that pan testing for you. Um, uh, and it, we have reps all around, the, all around the country that will have an application uh, with the after unit that you can actually characterize that pan and see where that is. Um, we don't publicly release those results. Um, I don't know why. Um, I guess we don't do a whole lot of pan testing yet. But that technology is out there. So anybody here about the pacemaker piece and, and how induction you have to be kind of hands off? Are you getting any kind of feedback on that at all? I see a smile here. Not as much? OK. Again, induction technology has come a long way over time. And most of it has built-in safeties where if the pan's not on there, I'm not sending out any current. The only thing you're sending out is a little bit of a ping that's looking for some kind of metallic source. OK, once I see that source, then I'm going to energize and, and deliver that inductive current. But outside of that, there's little to no worry. And again, I'm only pitching that just maybe an inch above that cooking surface. So unless I'm laying on that surface, I'm not worried about anything from an induction standpoint harming me. And then just this last piece, uh, the concerns on using a glass top in the back of the house, whatever the application is going to be with, with cooking, people get concerned about that glass. Okay? And we did a bowling ball drop test on our stock pot range. And again, I'm talking about a plate of glass about this big and this big. Is that something you can set up, Roger? Okay. Because we have a video online that tries to get past that kind of mental block from an induction standpoint of, of that glass and the glass breaking. Um, the glass out there is fairly robust. We had to be mindful of it. We use shot ceramic in a lot of our products. Uh, manufacturers, there's a lot of other good ceramics out there in the marketplace. But it can be very robust. So we have a 10-pound bowling ball, and we're going to drop this onto our stock pot range. It's pretty solid. Uh, that's 6 millimeter. I mean, you talk about six millimeter, it's not like that. It's, it's not huge. But the way that they manufacture that glass, it's fairly robust. So those concerns you can get over after, after a conversation. You know, that piece there, can, it rates about 90 to 100 pounds is about the, uh, the weight tolerance that it's going to have. But it was handling a 10-pound bowling ball just fine. So I went back and forth on anything. Again, Dr. Sean is in the back. If you have anything driving from an induction question standpoint, anyone in the the room, or are we pretty good? Any other questions coming in on Skype that we have to worry about? OK, then I think we're good. Then uh, David, we got a short break again? or? Yeah, we're going to take a short break while we switch over the pre presenters and um, reset the uh, Skype. All right, well, thanks so much. <clears throat> good. OK, Okay. it looks like uh, we're ready to get restarted again. And so I'd like to get everybody back uh, sitting down. And for our last speaker, uh, we have Paul from Wellbuilt. Uh, Paul is actually has a very, very rich experience. He's been in the appliance industry for over 30 years. He has a chemical engineering background. And he has been working for Wellbuilt for the past dozen years. And he is the senior field marketing manager for many of the Wellbuilt brands, including Mary Chef, the uh, Garland Clamshell, and Garland Induction Products. And uh, Paul's just got a, a wealth of knowledge and has got some great stories to share with us. So please welcome Paul. Thanks a lot, David. Good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, the title of my presentation is Technologies Empowers Opportunities. So induction is a great technology. And uh, uh, opportunities with induction are amazing. And that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on how uh, induction is working. I think uh, Valrat and Cooktech covered that very well uh, before me. I'm just going to focus where induction is today, where induction is going in the future, and us, well-built, what are we doing with induction 
uh, in our product line. Wellbuilt is a manufacturer of commercial cooking equipment, um, such as walk-ins, uh, fryers, um, ice machines, uh, Dell Field uh, refrigeration, Garland cook, uh, cooking equipment, uh, all kinds, all sizes, master series, restaurant ranges. It's a huge, huge offering that you're going to find from uh, Wellbuilt. But uh, about six, seven years ago, when we took a look at the future of our equipment, um, gas is a very powerful mean of using heat to cook our food. But the future is not there. The future is somewhere else. And uh, we saw that the future is in induction. And that's why we went and started to look at acquisitions, which is the best company that we can buy out there. And there were many. There were uh, many companies for sale back then, seven, eight years ago. Um, I traveled uh, a lot of places, and I was fortunate to, uh, to study those companies. But we decided to buy a company back in Switzerland. So uh, this company is unique. This company is, um, as you can see in the picture, it's a very dynamic team, very young team, uh, with a lot of innovation, and it's worldwide. We saw their equipment all over, in Asia, in, uh, in Australia, in uh, Europe. Uh, Europe is very big for them. And also, we saw uh, the product in North America. Um, they were unique because they were the first one to introduce a uh, induction griddle. They were the first one to introduce a induction brazing pans. Um, they're the first one that we worked with uh, to put induction in clamshells. Okay, uh, so this company really impressed uh, me a lot. And today we are one of the top three manufacturers of induction worldwide. Okay, and. The other two companies are here with us. So you're really lucky to have all of us in the same uh, location. Um, induction, to me, it's the best way to generate heat. Okay, There is nothing faster than induction. Today, we have three technologies that can provide heat. You have uh, gas. Uh, you have uh, heating elements, electrical heating elements. And you have induction. The most powerful burner that we have at Garland is called the Starfire burner. It's a 35,000 BTU burner. Okay, that's in the industry. Everybody knows us for that. Okay, but when you put induction next to it, when we put uh, a 3.5 kilowatt induction burner next to a 35,000 BTU burner, and we put one liter of water, I can boil that liter of water in less than two minutes where on gas, I'm going to take about five to six minutes. So I'm three times faster. But just imagine now I take that liter of water and I put it on a five kilowatt unit. Now I'm boiling my water, my liter of water, in 90 seconds. Now imagine again, I take that liter of water and I put it on a seven kilowatt unit. Okay, And now I'm boiling my water in less than 60 seconds. So. Induction is very powerful, but the most amazing thing about induction, it's very safe. So you're going to see induction in healthcare. You're going to see induction in nursing homes. You're going to see induction in uh, military bases, where more and more you're not going to see open fire flames uh, as products. Uh, so, And at the end of the day, it's super cool to the touch when you're working with induction. Um, I said that the technology is empowers opportunities, okay? And the biggest opportunity with induction is speed. And I talked to you about the speed. But what does it mean at the end of the day for somebody who has a restaurant? If I have a six burner to do my capacity, now I maybe I can do it with four burners. And then my hood is smaller. And then my kitchen is smaller. So. Induction will give you the flexibility, the opportunity to do more capacity in a smaller space. That's about induction. Energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency, uh, we talked about uh, 80% to 95%. And I would say 
a good induction <coughs> unit is going to deliver 95% efficiency or even more. <coughs> so efficiency is very important, and efficiency means speed. So at the end of the day, every time you're more efficient, you're cooking much faster. Uh, flexibility. Uh, you saw the product from all of us. But the way we are organized at Garland is we're taking induction and putting it in uh, the day-to-day -day <coughs> stuff that we do, that we build at Garland. So we put them in ranges. We put them in counters. We integrate the induction uh, components inside your kitchen. You want the dual hobs on the left. You want the quad on the right. You want the griddle in the middle. You want the brazing pan. We do that any way the customer wants it. So we build island suites inside the, our facilities, OK? And we customize. Uh, we work a lot with uh, consultants. We work a lot with architects and designers. And uh, we create the kitchen that they want. So safety, everybody talked about that. Accuracy, uh, like Dan mentioned, you know, you go from high power boiling to simmering in seconds, in seconds. Uh, so if you're doing chocolate, if you're melting sugar, uh, induction is the best way. With gas, uh, if you take a look at somebody who's doing, uh, who's melting sugar or doing chocolate on gas, the chef is always going like this, watching the flame, because the flame is creeping on you. Temperature will always rise on gas. But with induction, when you set it to a certain power level, you'll always get that same power level. It doesn't creep up on you. So accuracy is amazing. Uh, ease of use, um, there are several ways you can use the induction, either um, capacitive uh, screens just at the touch or rotary switches, whatever. Uh, both of them are in the marketplace. Both of them makes it easy to the customer uh, to interface with the unit. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're saving money. OK, why? Because we're using less energy. If you think about it, uh, first thing we do when we get into a restaurant in the morning is we turn everything on. OK, all the burners are on, all the ovens are on. And an average time for operation is 15 hours a day. OK, so for 15 hours, you're consuming energy. With induction, every time you lift that pan out of the uh, burner, you stop consuming energy. And I've been doing some studies uh, lately just to understand if a restaurant is operating 15 hours, what is the real load time that we are seeing on the burners? And I can see easy six to seven hours of idle time okay, during the day. So if you put that into <laughs> your financial equation, consumption of 15 hours of gas versus nine hours of electric, uh, David showed that uh, it's about the same cost mm -hmm. annually. I'm telling you, it's less. You're going to be saving money. Not only that, the HVAC system is 30% of the consumption of the power. And HVAC system, you're going to be saving 50%. 50% of your bill, you're going to be saving if you're using induction because you're not throwing heat back into your room. Any questions so far? Where are we using induction today? Okay, Induction is everywhere. Okay, Induction is in automotive big time. Induction is used to do melting of steel, uh, brazing of steel, uh, welding, um, fiber optics use induction uh, to, uh, to make fiber optics. The technology is used everywhere. You know, uh, induction was invented um, in the first um, part of the 20th century. So it's over 100 years old. It's nothing new. The first company that came up with an induction machine was in England in 1921. So induction has been there for a long time. Um, the Europeans have been using uh, induction uh, cooking equipment for the last 30 years, easy for the last 30 years. We just started about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. The technology is using 
clean energy. The technology is sustainable. And it's important to think not only about the financial. Financial are important, and I told you you're going to be saving money. But it's more important for the future, uh, for our kids, for our workers, the workers that are working in the kitchen that cannot withstand the heat and for 25 cents more, they will go somewhere else, okay? And for ourselves. With induction, your carbon footprint is zero. There is no emission of carbons at all with induction. So it's a, a sustainable technology. It's the technology of the future. All the new um, generation, the millenniums, are very, very familiar of interfacing with such a technology. Now, where is the technology going in the future? <laughs> okay, For us, for the US, where are we going with that technology in the future? Well, there is two big efforts really today. Uh, one is transportation. So transportation is looking at putting more and more electrical cars uh, out. And with the electrical cars comes charging the battery. Um, if you go today at Best Buy, and buy a charger for your cell phone, there is a small plate, and it's called an induction charger. So you put the phone on top of that induction charger, and it charges the, plate, uh, the phone automatically without any wires. Well, the same thing with the cars. In Europe, they have been testing, uh, putting in the streets plates on the floor, so the car drives on top of the plate and charges the battery automatically for 15 minutes. So that is a very, very big effort um, that is being, uh, that's happening, uh, pushing induction cars. But aircraft, aircraft now are flying with electric motors. Um, two years ago, we saw an aircraft that did, um, fl uh, flew around the world with solar panels. So electric induction motors are really, really big. This is the first ever of where induction is going in the future. But the second one that's really even bigger is commercial kitchens. So you're going to be seeing induction in combi ovens. You're going to be seeing induction in convection ovens. You're going to be seeing induction in uh, skillets, in uh, tilting pans. You're going to be seeing induction everywhere because it's the most efficient way of generating heat. You know, uh, I was uh, with uh, one of some brilliant minds and uh, not too long ago at uh, WellBuilt, and um, they were working on putting induction in ice machines. And I said, ice machines? That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's new to me. So the defrosting cycle of the ice machine, we're looking at putting induction in there because it's super fast and it's very efficient. So Europe is the first one that started about 30 years ago. Where are they? They're at about 40% penetration. What does it mean, 40% penetration? 40% penetration, you take a country like Switzerland, and they're at 85% induction in their restaurants. So most of their component in the restaurant at, at, are at 85%. Germany is at 60%. England is at 35%. Italy, Spain, they're at 35% and growing. So we're looking at induction penetration in Europe to be 50% by 2021. Here in the US, we just started. I started with induction when we started buying the company. And I'm telling you, I'm growing my business double digit every year. Double digit every year. And it's not linear, it's exponential. My, uh, my best customers are consultants and designers and architects because they have a vision of what the kitchen of the future is. And by working with them, we are doing uh, major changes in that industry. So um, this is a research company, totally independent, uh, founded on the internet, doesn't have nothing to do with us, but it's predicting that the market is going to be $660 million in the U.S. by the year 2021, which is only a couple of years from now. 
which is huge. What do we do at Garland? What do we do at, uh, with induction? We, our offering is very similar to uh, CookTech and to uh, Volred. We have our countertop units. Um, that's uh, a portion of our core business. But the second piece of our business is the designer series, is the product that we integrate in a kitchen, similar to what you see over here. The countertop uh, line, it's a brand new line. It's very different, again, based on technology. So we had the first generation induction uh, that we had for many years now uh, with the European. The second generation induction is really different. Features like cook and hold standard on the equipment. Features like locking uh, a certain uh, setup uh, parameter inside the cooking cycle is also standard with the new equipment. Um, timers, they're all standard. All the unit come with timers now on the equipment. Uh, but more important uh, about the new equipment is the uh, software. The software and the hardware is very, very different. And again, if you have been playing with our product in the past and saw how fast we, uh, we heat products, this thing is even going to blow your mind even more. It's at least 25% faster than our old generation. So Now, on the uh, built-in product, the stuff that we can do island suites with or whatever. The bottom uh, picture that you see is uh, drop-ins. So a drop-in, you just drop it from the top. You, it goes on a granite counter, or it goes on a uh, stainless steel top. Very, very simple. But you always need air. And the air will be a tube like this at the bottom where you cannot put anything else underneath. OK, so you need the air to cool down the unit and you don't have anything, any more space to put anything uh, underneath. But with the module line, which is the island suite and which is the unit here on the right hand side, is now I can put my cooking top at the top. But my brain, which is the inverter, the generator at the bottom, comes with a 10 foot cable and I can put that generator 10 feet away from the cooking top, which means I can put refrigeration underneath, which means I can put a range underneath, a plate warmer, whatever my kitchen needs. Now I have the space and I have the technology to make it happen. And the last one uh, that all of us talked about is holding the food. Holding the food is a very, very big industry here in North America. Uh, steam wells is a thing of the past. Anybody that's looking um, you know, to uh, renovate his steam well um, is going to induction. Uh, why? Better, uh, longer holding times. And the longer holding times is because of precise temperature. You're, you're dialing a precise temperature. Uh, with steam tables, you put the steam up to 111 degrees, and you're over drying your food and maximum will be 20, 25 minutes. Now you can extend your holding time to 30, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, and you can dial a, pre a specific. In Europe, broccoli is around 180, cauliflower is 185. We can dial precise temperature with the holding products that we have. So, so there is a couple of uh, things that uh, I need to highlight about especially the griddle and the brazing pan. Um, I'm very biased, so those two products are my favorite. And the reason is, um, we talked about it uh, with CookTech, you can get to temperature in less than four minutes, which is amazing. Very even temperature from one corner to the other. And uh, sir, you asked about searing. Uh, searing is a function of the uh, composition of the metal that you're putting your proteins on, okay? So um, with chrome nickel, uh, chrome nickel is, uh, is a metal that's almost an insulator 
So that means all the energy is captured inside the metal. Very little is given to the environment. And that makes your searing impeccable. So um, I have my chefs when I go around the country and uh, we do demonstrations. Um, they throw on the griddle uh, Parmesan cheese. And I said, Parmesan cheese? <laughs> what are you trying to do? And they go to me, Paul, you have to show them the that this griddle can do different density. So the Parmesan cheese is very light, doesn't have any density. Uh, it's uh, it's even more hard, you know, to get a nice browning and searing on it. When you have a steak or a salmon or whatever, it's even much more easier. So um, searing is not a problem. Recovery, Dan is absolutely right. There is no recovery with induction, okay? In order to go to recovery, you have to go 25 degrees F below set point. Uh, our product will never go below 25 degrees from set point, never. You will see five degrees, you will see eight degrees, you will never see 25 degrees uh, below set point on a griddle or a, uh, or a brazing pan. Uh, so what are we working on? Well, we came out with the new uh, master series range, which is 14 uh, kilowatts and 20 kilowatts with a convection-based oven. But we complemented that family with uh, uh, also with storage bases, with um, a uh, griddle with a storage base, and we also have a brazing pan. And uh, when I'm finished uh, over here, uh, Chef Lance is our chef here in California. Uh, he, this is the second time I work with Chef Lance. He's just amazing. And he's preparing such nice food in the bag, but he's not cooking them. He's prepping everything. You'll see the cooking once you go to the back. Um, and uh, he's going to be cooking on the brazing pan. He's going to be cooking on the wok, on the, on the griddle. My last piece of the presentation has to do with holding. Okay, holding is almost 50% of the business. Holding is very big out there, and, uh, and it's getting bigger. Uh, we offer uh, a variety of products with holding, uh, 12 by 20 uh, pens uh, size for holding uh, with remote uh, generators. We also do a 12 by 12 for chafing dishes. Um, some of the examples of projects we have done, uh, the bottom picture is a countertop uh, holding unit that has several vessels on it at the same time. So it's capable of taking several vessels at the same time. The top uh, picture on, uh, on my left, <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure, it's a, um, it's a Dell Field base, okay, with a granite top with four uh, holding uh, stations, 12 by 20 with a sneeze guard. And the other ones are holding uh, 12 by uh, 12 for chafing dishes. Um, this, is, this is very unique. This is very different. I've, uh, I've seen that in Europe. It's a manufacturer of glass tables. And he buys our Garland Induction HO1500, and he puts it under the glass. So, uh, and the reason he chose the HO1500 is we are less than three and a half inches thick total, okay? And we offer 31 inch in length of uh, heating zones. So those tables are used for uh, warming buffets, but they also used for presentation. So if you don't have anything for warming, you just put the food on the glass, or at the end of the night, you can use them as bar tables because they have a suspension system that you can put them higher or lower. Uh, they're very unique, very nice, very expensive. It's not cheap. Uh, and here are some other concepts. Uh, in this hotel that I saw also in Europe, uh, they use them as computer tables after they finished uh, um, serving their buffets or whatever they're trying to do with it. So they, um, every table comes with a uh, power cord, plugs to the wall and people can plug their computer to it or whatever after that. But very unique, very different. Uh, here is some examples of stuff that we have done. So this is uh, Chef Michel Richard. Uh, he um, bought two island suites in New York. Uh, they're uh, all induction with uh, griddles and uh, uh, duels and quads. 
Um, there was articles written. Uh, he's a big chef with about 10 or 15 restaurants around the USA. Um, this is uh, Rudy. Rudy is um, our first restaurant 15 years ago where we put the griddle. The first griddle that we made went into uh, Rudy's and it's still operating with the original griddle today. The picture that I took uh, over there was about three, four years old, so it's not that old. Uh, and that's Rudy. Uh, we have uh, holding equipment all over the world. We have uh, here in Dubai, uh, we also have in Greece, we have in Morocco, and we have in France, um, all kind of installation of holding. This is in Switzerland, but I have uh, buffet line, uh, cafeterias uh, in, um, uh, at SUNY University in um, Buffalo, uh, New York. Uh, I have in um, Pennsylvania uh, cafeterias like this with induction holding uh, lines in them. Um, this is uh, Johnson Wales. Johnson Wales serves 600 pasta dishes every day on 16 induction units from Garland. So uh, and it's been operation for many years. The, um, the, the scotch in the front is our old scotch and we have changed that maybe five, six years ago. Um, culinary schools are very big with us. Okay, so we, uh, this is Humber College. We built four uh, island suites, um, a, a total of 32 stations with convection ovens underneath. Uh, uh, Five-star restaurants all over. Um, Auberge uh, we have. We have also Canoe. And um, casual uh, dining is uh, very big with us. Uh, one piece of equipment I didn't talk to you about is the fajita. A fajita unit, all it does, it warms up a metal plate. So uh, we can warm up that metal plate from ambient temperature to 650 in 72 seconds. So, uh, and that's all it does. You cannot cook on it anything else. Just warm up the fajita plates for uh, chilies. Boston Pizza is very big. This is the pasta station with refrigera a refrigeration base at the bottom and uh, re-thermalizing uh, st uh, stations at the top with four watts, five kilowatts each. Very, very powerful. Uh, Porto Pasta, there is about a couple of hundred locations in Europe. They're all over the shopping center. You can find them there. Fabiano is also very big in Europe and uh, uses our equipment. I, uh, I would like to thank you for your patience. I know you're hungry. So <laughs> I hope uh, this was beneficial, the three of us being here and talking about induction. And if you have any questions before we go to the back. I'll, it will be a pleasure taking any questions from you. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Um, one comment I want to ha make is on the chilies, using the induction for warming the fajita plates is huge. I remember doing a project with the chilies about 15 years ago, and they had a charbroiler dedicated to warming fajita plates. And the thing was just going nonstop. They couldn't cook on it because it was covered in the fajita plates. And that was just, you know, obviously radiating a lot of gas or a lot of energy and heat into the kitchen just to keep those fajita plates hot. Um, we did actually have one question that came through the, uh, the Skype presentation, and I wanted to ask it of all of our presenters. And it was a question regarding the uh, EMF radiation from the induction. And would you please all be prepared to talk to that? What, was the oh. again? Um, what can you speak to EMF radiation from induction equipment? Okay, for the EMF radiation, you know, for the induction, the I think the disadvantage for the induction is the EMC radiation and the conduction. So most time for the induction uh, cooking unit, uh, conducted EMC is a big issue for every this uh, induction maker. So uh, the reason is induction itself. Is this a noise generator? Because you know we have to generate high frequency, right? AC current. So this is just a source for this noise. So we have to just limit this uh, noise under some uh, level. 
is required by the uh, induction standard by the FCC. So uh, I don't know if every capacitor have the same issue, but I think so. Uh, this uh, for this EMC conduct EMC is very hard to just overcome. So we have to we need a very experienced the engineers working on this stuff. So this takes because for the education sometimes theory cannot resolve this issue. This uh, the practice and the theory is opposite. So they can some sometimes it cannot work. So you need a very experienced engineer to work on this stuff, uh, especially for some high power level this induction unit, three phase, right? So five thousand. 7,000, some, some unit they can handle more than 20 kilowatts. So we have our partner, right, in China. This is uh, called Induct. They build just a three-phase, high, very heavy-duty induction cooktop. So they, uh, the maximum power for one single unit is uh, just one, one burner, 24 kilowatts. So it's very powerful. They can heat water maybe one liter of water, just uh, several seconds. <laughs> the boiling, from the room temperature to boiling, just several seconds. So it's very powerful. But for them, they have headache. So they very hard for them to pass the EMC, conduct EMC. So, but the reason is for some country, because induction, even we have induction, right, in the, for the, uh, in the world, uh, 1980s, right, early 1980s. But for the standard, this EMC standard, just the rest of the years. So before, we have no just uh, 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 standard for the conducted EMC on the induction cooktop. Uh, so some country, they still have no, no this limiting on conduct EMC. Uh, however, the US, has, US and some Europe and some country, they have this limiting. So you have, if you want to get the FCC certification, you must uh, pass this test. Uh, why we need to pass this EMC, right, conduct EMC? The reason is they will affect another electrical equipment on the power line. So if you cannot limit this noise to, uh, to the uh, under limiting, right, they will cause the other equipment uh, gets just uh, uh, non-functional or just uh, uh, makes a mistake. For example, sometimes uh, I work in GE before, right, so this uh, residential induction. Uh, some customers complain. They have the iPhone. At that time, the iPhone 4. iPhone 4. So when they close to the induction unit, cannot work. iPhone 4 cannot get, pick the phone, pick, pick the call. I cannot call out, cannot call in. So <laughs> at that time, that time, the reason is this induction limiting, I mean, this EMS limiting is poor. But finally, whatever, we resolve that issue. So we, we can make the, this uh, induction work with some uh, most, it cannot affect or just uh, interference with other uh, equipment in the same power line. So. And that's why I brought Dr. Sean. <laughs> Four more questions? Okay. Thanks. Uh, this one is for the manufacturers. Um, how common are you guys seeing more use of induction technology and more specialized equipment such as fryers as we get uh, spend more time into this category? What what do you guys have for uh, more specialized purpose-built equipment such as uh, fryers using induction? Let's start with a uh, Volrath. Sorry, I was talking. I was preparing for the first question because I don't have Dr. So and so. I called an engineer. Um, he, he was uh, he was going to answer that question for me. But um, as far as fryers, and, and I know there are some companies working on it. I know that it is it is definitely going to be the future. I mean, there are other things I've heard of, like dishwashers that induction is being looked into, coffee brewers. There is a lot of equipment out there where you're going to see induction in the very very near future. As far as what we're working on in that regard, I mean, obviously, we are more of a front of house specialist, so we're probably not working on any of those pieces of equipment just mentioned. Thank you, Kathy. Paul? Yeah, we, uh, we looked at uh, induction fryers. Uh, we actually uh, uh, looked at it seriously. 
It's something that we have in our hopper. Uh, we have several projects that we are working on these days. So we have to, uh, we have limited resources like everybody else, so we prioritize. And uh, right now our focus is uh, to complement the holding line with brand new products on the holding line. That's where we're focusing right now. And, and just to follow up on the fryer piece, the, one of the challenges on an induction fryer is electric fryers are so efficient because the element's actually in the oil that the advantages of an induction fryer, when you look at it on paper, really aren't there. Um, it's not that we're still not looking, you know, to Paul's point. We're always throwing things on the wall and seeing where we can take induction. Now, we've got some creative ideas of how we might put that fryer in the marketplace, but I can't convince some people to try it. So we're always drawing things up on the drawing board. and. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, we do have limited resources, and we have to look at where we put that you know, engineering energy, what's going to be the biggest return on investment. And since fryer category electric is, in the U.S. specifically, is maybe 10 to 15 percent of the marketplace, it's so dominated by gas that those efficiencies, you don't really get anything more out of it yet because electric is so efficient as it is currently. So I think from a fryer standpoint, there might be limitations as far as other types of uh, equipment. Let your imagination run on that one. Anything that you can do a, a steel plate. I mean, you talked about the brazers and, and fryers are there. If you look at international markets, there are induction fryers. Their limitations are they're putting that energy on the bottom. And from a fryer standpoint, all your sediment sinks to the bottom. So now you're going to carbonize that. So application specific, there's lots of equipment out there. Induction makes sense for a lot of it, not all of it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we had a great panel of presenters, and so we, we really appreciate all of your input. And now we can open up the kitchen, and you can see some live cooking in the kitchen. And this will now conclude the Skype presentation. Thank you very much.